is Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily with Andrew Hustler Patterson and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, folks? It is a game day here in Peg City. Andrew Patterson with you on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. And the Habs are in town to take on the Winnipeg Jets, who begin a three-game homestand tonight, 7 o'clock, Canada Life Centre, and what should be an always entertaining atmosphere when one of the original six teams, especially Canadian original six team, comes to town. Uh, we're going to talk about it with Brandon Rowicki coming up a little bit later on. And we'll also hear from head coach Rick Bonus on tonight's game and tonight's roster, as well as Pierre-Luc Dubois, who spoke earlier today after the morning skate. Uh, with the Habs coming to town, I thought it was a perfect opportunity to welcome in our old pal Mo Khan from Montreal. We'll get the latest on the visiting Canadien and um, also talk probably a little bit of Canada World Cup with Mo who's all over the Canadian men's national team and the countdown to Qatar is on right now with the event beginning in just over a couple of weeks. Um, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton normally joins us on Friday, but the saw unavailable tomorrow. So Lee will jump on in the final hour of the program as well. So we should be packed. We'll talk lots of Jets Habs. Brandon Rewicki, as I mentioned, we'll hear from Bones and Dubois, as well as get the latest on the Habs side of things with Mo Khan coming up in just a few minutes. Um, lots to get to today on the program as well, coming out of last night. By the way, shout out to everyone that rode with me in the lock shop yesterday. The little plus 700 banger in three different sports. And a big part of that was the Astros win in the World Series last night. The second ever no-hitter in World Series play. A combined no-hitter. Uh, Christian Javier, absolute smoke for six innings. And then the Astros, ball, uh, the Astros bullpen came in to finish the job. And uh, uh, we got a series now, folks. Two and two. Verlander against Syndergaard tonight in a very, very crucial game five before the series shifts back to Houston, Texas for game six and seven. As while I'm here, I should basically just quickly fire out a tweet that says we are live. We'll do that right now. And then not uh, going to bring in Mokan in just a couple of minutes. Um, Before we do anything, though, got to thank the sponsors that make Winnipeg Sports Talk happen each and every day. Of course, our great betting partners over at CoolBet. The gang at Princess Auto, not Auto Corp, who brings us the why not question of the day, as well as Consolidated Supply, Vita Health Fresh Market, Wallace and Wallace, Culligan Water, Royal Sports, F Apparel, Boston Pizza, Canadian Club Whiskey, and of course the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, and our favorite Winnipeg local beer, Little Brown Jug. Um, one other thing coming out of yesterday, and <laughs> listen, I enough people are dunking on the CFL right now. So I will refrain from doing that. Uh, it was quite embarrassing though. The announcement after we were off the air yesterday that, uh, hold the phone, those all-stars we announced earlier, uh, those weren't the right ones. Um, I guess they'd put too much emphasis on the fan voting, uh, which is very unfortunate, but, um, there were some guys that were announced as all-stars yesterday, that are no longer all-stars today. I was questioning where the heck Nick Dembski was. Uh, well, he is an all-star, but unfortunately, Nick Dembski's in, and three members of the Bombers are out. Jamarcus Hardrick, Winston Rose, and Donald Rutledge were originally announced as all-stars. Now they're no longer all-stars. So um, that is unfortunate. A number of the uh, Stampeder offensive linemen that were so bent out of shape that they weren't involved uh, got on there. Sean McEwen, Ryan Sevier, and Derek Dennis. The other two offensive linemen, of course, Stanley Bryant and Patrick Newfeld from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And sounds like, and I know many of you, I honestly, I could care less who the Grey Cup halftime show is. Uh, I'll usually be doing something else at halftime. But for those of you that are really geeked about it or have been mad online that we don't know about it, it sounds like we're going to get that clarity over the course of uh, potentially the next 24 hours. So if it breaks during the show, we'll be sure to let you know. Um, but listen, we're going to get right into it with Mo Khan. Talk a little Montreal Canadiens, Winnipeg Jets. Tee it up tonight before hearing from Dubois going up against the Habs as well as Bones a little bit later on. 
Uh, but listen, just before we do that, let me give a big shout out and thanks to our friends at Consolidated Supply for their support and sponsorship of Winnipeg Sports Talk. They are your first choice for irrigation, for golf cars, for small engine parts, landscape materials, and incredible things for your property, including hot tubs and outdoor kitchens and barbecues. They really have everything from lawn and garden to golf and bring you the highest quality products and exceptional customer service from our guys, Joe, Spicy, Gino, and the gang. If you haven't ever checked out Consolidated Supply, what are you waiting for? Pop down and see them in person and everything they've got going down at 1395 Niagara Road East. And you can also check out their new relaunched website over at cte.ca. Um, our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market feature great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries. A great local company, family owned and operated since 1936, and carrying Winnipeg's largest assortment of local products, too. And, gang, with November being Men's Health Month, choosing the right, national, uh, right natural health products are key. Vita Health carries everything you need to help relieve prostate issues, reduce stress and support mental focus from Canadian brands like Prairie Naturals, who donate a portion of sales to the Canadian Men's Health Foundation. Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives with seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge. And you can check them out online at their fully shoppable website at myvita.ca. And hey, I got to give a big... Uh, Stick tap to our friends at Wallace and Wallace who are busy right now helping Winnipeggers get ready for the upcoming winter. I know it's gorgeous. By the way, all-time record yesterday, 19 degrees. Had a little fun with Dusty who was dealing with eight inches of snow in Edmonton. Uh, but we know that's coming. We know it's coming probably soon and probably in time for that football game on the 13th of November. But in the meantime, before it happens, make sure that your uh, garage door is ready and winterized. Um, you do want to make sure your check to your photo isn't blocked, dirty, or misaligned. And if it's noisy, you got to lubricate your rollers and hinges with a high quality lithium or silicon based grease. Or you can call Wallace and Wallace and take advantage of their winter maintenance program. It's the med it's their version of a medical checkup for your door. Their technicians will poke and prod their way through a 21 point checklist, making sure your door is ready for the winter ahead. To book your service call, go to Wallace Doors. Or call them at 452-2700. All right, let's get right to it. Uh, you know, it had been overdue for a return of a WST favorite in Mocan. I figured with the World Cup just around the corner and the Habs in town tonight, today was a great day to do exactly that. And we welcome him in now. He uh, is he's now the voice of uh, Hockey I.O. coming out of Montreal <laughs> following all things Habs play-by-play -play voice for too many things to list. And, of course, one of the key stats guys in Montreal as well, our guy Mo Khan. You can follow him on Twitter at MoCon19. What's up? I'm well, Andrew. A bit nasally with this stupid weather we have of the warmth that we're going through. It's screwed up my system, so I am awful right now. I need to get this focused and ready to go for the weekend because it's going to be nice and warm and 20 degrees in Montreal, and it's going to be gorgeous for the great, uh, for the playoff game on Sunday as well. Hey, you know what? Just quickly, because I mean, I know we're going to sort of get into uh, some hockey, and I do want to touch on some soccer with you. But uh, what's yeah. the uh, what's the vibe around the Alouettes right now? I mean, you know, you follow the Canadian Football League really closely. I mean, uh, this is an interesting matchup. Hamilton's had a really disappointing season. They've shown some signs of life over the course of the last sort of six weeks. Um, what do you make of the challenge for the Alouettes to get through this challenge at home and uh, make their way to BMO for a trip to uh, Regina? I think the Owls wish they played the Riders as opposed to the Ticats, Andrew. I think the Ticats match up well with the Alouettes. You think about the two home losses that the – or the two road losses that Hamilton had in Montreal uh, back in the late summer, August, and early September. They came out to the last five minutes of the football game. And I think now going to this matchup period, the wealth of experience that Hamilton has at this point of the year with their playoff runs of late, this game is going to be tricky for the Alouettes. I think the key for Montreal is going to be their old land play. And how does their defense react? Because their defense under Noel Thorpe has been hot and cold, and they need to be gangbusters out there and really make things difficult for the Hamilton offense on Sunday afternoon. Uh, any thoughts on Calgary, BC, while we're uh, while we're on it? Yeah, it's gonna be fascinating. I think, like, look, the Nathan Rourke aura is really picked up. I think we know what's what that's all about. I think it should be a great kind of BC place on on Sunday. I think the key will be for BC in particular is the receiving core. 
They're talented. They have a wealth of depth to work with. Can they beat their one-on-one matchups on Sunday? If they can, given that work is still trying to work himself into football shape, that just might alleviate the stress off of Nathan Work and allow this team to kind of win it with the running game and their pass catchers gave the yak for them moving forward. All right, Mo, let's get to it. We got the Habs in town tonight. It's always a fun night when the Canadians come in. There'll be a lot of red and white and blue in this stands. Although I know it sometimes brings out the best in the home fans as well. But I'm interested in your thoughts on the Habs through you know the first nine, ten games of the season. This is a team that most people expected would be near the bottom of the National Hockey League. But the one thing we can say about Marty St. Louis' team, um, they are grinding it out for a full 60 minutes. They've got some exciting young players, and they've actually had some positive results so far. Yeah, they have. And, and I think what Marty St. Louis has done for this team right now, Andrew, when you think about it, is that he is still the belief that, look, go out there, play your game. If you, if you make a mistake, you make a mistake. Not the end of the world. But at the end of the day, for this team to move forward here, there are a lot of young guys to go through with the Suzuki's, with Sofkovsky, with Gooley, uh, with Harris as well, to let them grow and mature on the ice. Because at this point in the year, we all know the Habs are not going to go uh, any further from maybe, who knows, maybe from the last spot to maybe the 15th spot in the NHL. And I think half fans have accepted that, and they're all play, all praying a big part for Connor Bernard to be the guy moving forward if that's their pick in the spring draft next season. Yeah, so uh, here we are. Um, well, let's first of all, what's Slavkovsky been like so far? He's had seven games. He's actually scored a couple of goals. Um, you know, is he going to? Is he going to get ten games? Will he spend most of the time in the American Hockey League? Do you think? And uh, what have been the early results on the guy that they picked number one when just to what everyone in the building thought that they were going Shane Wright? Yeah, I think I think Slavkovsky will get the ten in Montreal and like they brought him on the road trip and he's had his ups and he's had his down. Look, it's reality is he's this eighteen year old kid who's six four, two thirty eight. He's still growing to his body physically, right? To understand how he how he operates at that level of weight that he's played at. And if you look at the game against Minnesota, where Marco Rossi was probably like five foot six, one hundred and twenty five pounds. He knocked him over his skates late in the, in the hockey game, and that kind of caused a big uh, Russian Russian missile crisis with uh, with the Habs in the Minnesota Wild. So I think in this game coming up here uh, against Winnipeg, he's scheduled to play the fourth line, and I think he'll get his minutes. But they know they're playing a long-term game here in Montreal with Slavkovsky where they'll say, look, we don't need him to score 40 goals this year. By age 24, 25 is where we think he will be uh, a big-time hitter for this franchise and be a guy that will be a foundation piece for the years to come for this franchise moving forward. You know, uh, they'll hope that they get the production out of Slavkovsky in the future that they're getting out of Cole Caulfield right now. And, oh, I'm sure this has been a topic on Hockey I.O. and throughout hockey forums and conversations on, you know, the uh, the station in Montreal about Cole Caulfield. He was having a brutal season last year. He had one goal, and then Marty St. Louis took over, and he has basically turned into an entirely different player. He's got seven goals now through 10 games on the season is on a point-per-game basis. Tell us about Caulfield's season and what is it, what happened when Marty St. Louis took over that has turned him into one of the more dangerous scorers in the NHL right now? Yeah, well, what happened was since February 10th of this year, he, Cole Caulfield has 23 even strength goals right behind Austin Matthews at 25 going to this week. Um, he told, excuse me, he told, uh, St. Louis told uh, Cole Caulfield, play your game. If you bleep up, you bleep up. Not the end of the world. Go out there, play your game. You're a goal scorer. You're a poacher of goals. You know your way around the net. And that's what he's done because under Dom Ducharme, it was sort of like a ragged tag where he got playing time, then it wasn't put in the key position to win a game or two along the way on, on the power play. Uh, if you remember the cup run, he was on and off the ice at times here under Ducharme. But under St. Louis, he's kind of grown and mature from where he was in his first game to where we are today going against Winnipeg. And look, he's on projection rate of 57 goals this year, which would be massive if he does hit that number. But I think half fans have something to build upon here with Caulfield, with Suzuki, and perhaps Slavkovsky being the three foundation pieces moving forward. But I think St. Louis has really instilled that confidence that don't worry about messing up, go play your game, and we'll correct those mental mistakes as you get older and stronger at the NHL level. Yeah, it, it is. It's such a fascinating connection because I mean, it's listen. I mean, Caulfield's a small guy. Marty St. Louis was almost always the smallest guy on the ice, Mo. And it really does seem like there's a connection between coach and player that you know, unlike most coach-player relationships, has absolutely had this young man blossom into the best version of Cole Caulfield. And I know that's exciting, Habs fans, right now. Even though expectations for the team this year are low. 
Yeah, I mean, think about this. Cole Coffey wore 26 for Marte St. Louis when he was playing minor hockey. Uh, I mean, the, the influence of St. Louis on, on Cole Coffey has been tremendous in the strides that he's taken at the NHL level. And I think now for Cole Coffey, excuse me, is this that. is is Right now, he's got to just grow his game in more than one way, right? Beyond being a goal scorer. And we saw a bit of it against St. Louis where he was playing a two-way game fairly well. We saw a bit of it against Minnesota as well. But I think now as he gets older and he gets more physically mature uh, and gets himself more adept to the speed of the NHL, Andrew, I think he definitely has potential to be a consistent 30-goal scorer. I think fans in Montreal expect him to score 40 this year. That could be hit, no question about that. I just think now moving forward towards the the, the 70-odd games left on the schedule for this team here, he definitely has a, an opportunity, a platform to really showcase to the NHL world that he's definitely the man to watch out for. And keep this in mind, he's an RFA after the season. So you know if he puts up more goals, he's going to get himself a nice, comfortable contract from Kent Hughes moving forward for the next uh, portion of his career coming up. You know, that top line right now has the new captain, Nick Suzuki, in the middle, Cole Caulfield on the left, and it looks like Kirby Doc on the right. Doc has yeah. always been a center, um, and I was sort of thought as going to maybe be that number two guy behind what um what's Marty St. Louis thinking with do with uh, Doc on the right side, and what have his early returns been as a new Canadian? Well, he's been yo-yoed uh, in the lineup so far, playing center at times here on the second third line. Uh, Sean Monahan has played as a right winger on that first line, and people like him with with uh, with Suzuki and with Caulfield. But, but Kirby Doc is a guy that they believe can be a, a two C for this roster. Uh, they brought him in uh, from Chicago because, look, like in Chicago, unfortunately, injuries derailed his career. Didn't even get going over there in, in Chi-Town. But they believe Ken Hughes is that this guy could definitely be a, a guy down the spine of the four lines with Suzuki as number one C, uh, Doc as number two C. And I just think they wanted to experiment and see how he feels because, look, he's had his moments of brilliance at times. But also there's times where you say, okay, well, you know what? He's just growing in, in maturing. And think about it right now, Andrew. Like the key positions on this team here, as I said before, with the Ghoulies, Harris, we look at Caulfield, we look at Suzuki, we look at Kirby Doc. These guys are all 24 or younger right now. So if they continue to project along here, where even though they might take their, their legs this season, maybe three, four years from now, when they enter the prime of their career, they might be in that conversation as being a cup contender than, than the rebuild that they're going through as we speak. Well, I mean, the rebuild happened quickly. I mean, this team was, you know, had that incredible playoff run two years ago, and then finished at the bottom of the standings last year. Um, the offseason was very interesting. They had the number one pick. They made a few deals. They've added some younger players in. Expectations are still low. But, Mo, what's the atmosphere around Habs fans right now when you're hosting Hockey I.O. on a weekly basis? I mean, what are the yeah. what are the hot-button topics around Montreal right now after a pretty good start that I think is maybe surprising people? You know, Sikovsky, Connor Bernard, Connor Bernard, Connor Bernard, right? Can they continue to lose out and, and get themselves in position for maybe the first overall pick in the NHL draft next June, Andrew? I think now, moving or July, beg your pardon. I think now, with the way they've been playing, they've been very competitive. They've been playing hot, hard hockey as well. But the thing is that there's a feeling right now that if the Habs don't get the number one pick, this is a deep draft next spring. So if they don't get the number one pick here, they think that the, the five projected names that will go in the top five of the draft could all be – not alphas, but can all be key draft picks that can help a team uh, moving down the road here. So I think the half fans are really excited to see how this team is being built up here. They've accepted the couple of terms. Look, they're not going to be competitive this year and probably for the next two years or less, who knows. But I think now the development of Sofkowski, who they bring in next spring, and also the fact they'll have some cap room to work with, whether they keep Carey Price and LTIR, who knows what's going to happen with him, and others that come off the books, that they could be players in the free agent thing come next summer to bring, make the team much more competitive than where they are as we speak. Yeah, the, the funniest thing, and I guess this will kind of transition to uh, you, know, you telling us about how Sean Monaghan's looked in his new home, is that for the veteran players on the Montreal Canadiens, it certainly seems from the fan base like they, you know, they want them to play well enough not to win, but well enough to boost their trade value for the trade deadline and let Kent Hughes add some more assets down at the deadline. Yeah, I think Sean Monahan is one of the guys that could be on the, on the block. Um, that's the name that we've been talking on hockey uh, inside out with Sean Monahan. That if he continues to elevate his his status, which he has, and puts himself in position to become a, a desirable trade asset come February, that he will be let go. Uh, there's also other names too. Uh, you have to consider with, with Dadenoff. He's been in and out of the lineup here. I think he's probably at the conclusion of his career as a Montreal Canadian, and Ken Hughes will figure it out probably sooner than later what to do with him. 
Uh, and there's always that question about Brendan Gallagher. I don't think he's going anywhere now, but I just think for his age, for the wear and tear he's gone through as a Montreal Canadian player, um, there's going to be a point in, in this time to say, hey, can I win a cup with this team? Probably not. And if he says, look, let me look for, uh, let me tell Ken Hughes to find me a spot where I can go win a cup. He saw what his buddy did last year, like did with the Avalanche, that he could be a guy to watch out for. And Yoel Armia, that's a name that's been sort of a, a, a very, how can I describe this here? Uh, a very polarizing uh, player in the, in the Montreal organization of how he's great one game and disappears for 10 games. So those are names I would watch out for going towards the Christmas into the new year that perhaps it's not, if it's not Gallagher that you're looking at a Sean Monahan that will be probably on the trade block come late February. Well, and, and you know, that third line, the way things are looking for tonight uh, here in the peg are, is fascinating. You got Monahan in his new home playing in the middle You've got Joel Armia, who you just mentioned, who still has a lot of fans here amongst the Jet fan base after the years that he had here in the peg. And then Jonathan Drouin on the on the left side. And he's had a number of trials and tribulations. I mean, things off the ice, things that he's been dealing with. Um, is he back, Mo? Um, where does he fit into this club? Does he have a long-term with the future with the Habs? I don't think so. It's unfortunate for 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 Joe Jouet. Like he he's a good person. I I, I have gotten to converse with him a couple of times uh, as a habit, and, and he he's a well spoken person. I just think that in this market, the expectations that came with him coming to Montreal four or five years ago for Sergeyev, and we saw Sergeyev win two cups and now become a key player for the Tampa Bay Lightning. That he's never lived up to the expectations. The injuries have curtailed him. He's had some mental health issues that took him off the ice, uh, which he is taking care of, which is great for his mindset. But I just think for him, if he's been playing hard, he's been working hard under Martin St. Louis. I think for him now, uh, a, a new change of address could be the the works for him to get himself back on track. And perhaps they're saying Colorado could be a play for him uh, by deadline day because he will be a free agent after the season. And I think a new scenery could help him get himself back to where people thought he would have been as a top three pick back in the 2013 draft. How much baggage does he hold or does the fan base put on his shoulders because of how he was acquired, where he was drafted, and the fact that Mikhail Sergachev, who was traded for him, is now a part of a Stanley Cup winning blue line and has a couple of rings? It's unfortunate because, you know, just like in the Winnipeg market, how crazy this city is for hockey, that when you're Shea New and you're one of the locals here, they think you're Guy Lafleur. And, and Joe Druitt is not Guy Lafleur. He is an artist with a puck in his stick that can make those passes, but unfortunately, he has not been able to do so with the Montreal Canadiens. He's had a, a bad run of luck with this organization. And now move towards uh, the remainder of the season that's left over, you see – on the power play, he's trying very hard. He still has that that ilk to him. He can make a big play here and there. I think now moving towards the the uh, November to December, it'll be key for him to kind of establish himself once again. And if he does do so, he could be a guy that could be looked at pound as be look. Let's bring him on more for a run in springtime and, and for a signing cup for that, for that is. But if not, though, I think for Ken Hughes moving forward here, he's got to decide. Look, is he part of the foundation? Probably not. And let's get rid of him now so we can get some value in return for him because, quite frankly, he needs to go somewhere else to kind of excel with his career. Mo Condon, Montreal, Hockey Inside Out is the show weekly. You can subscribe to it on YouTube and check out Mo's work. Um, i got to ask you about a couple individuals on the blue line. And uh, I'll start it off with Caden Gooley. I remember I was at the Ice Cave here in Winnipeg last year, Mo, and his first game for the Edmonton Oil Kings uh, when he'd been acquired in trade. At the time, the Oil Kings and Ice were the number one and two teams in the country. And even in a game with the top two teams, he really did stand out, had an incredible rest of the season. And he seems to be the real deal right now. I'm looking, he's playing top line minutes right now. Um, a huge part of this team. How good has this young defenseman been? And has he exceeded expectations considering how challenging it can be to move up from junior, never mind just into an NHL lineup, to be playing where he's playing in the hierarchy of the blue line? He really has. Uh, he's He's gone beyond expectations for this Montreal team. Fans love him. Uh, when he was drafted a couple of years, years ago during the COVID year, uh, many people didn't know. And remember, Andrew, the dub didn't get going uh, after his draft year. It was sort of stunted, right? They didn't play hockey, really, to be honest with you. So he lost a year of development, and he still excelled, right? And he could have made this team last year, but they sent him back down to, to the WHL uh, to get another year's seasoning. And I think now he has really grown. Like him and David Savard, uh, Kovacevic 
these veteran guys here have really helped mentor him. And the thing is, he's done this without Mike Matheson in the lineup, uh, without Edmondson in the lineup here as well. So he's gotten this baptism by fire where he's really excelled. Now, with those guys coming back at some point in the next few weeks or, or very sooner, sooner than later, he's a guy to watch out for that if he continues to excel, he will become a mainstay for this team. But there's no question that for Mark Berger, for his faults that he's had, this is probably one of his better draft choices that has really excelled and panned up whereas in his years past, you look at the former first-round picks for the Montreal Canadiens since 2006, a lot of these guys get one contract and they've been out. This is a guy that could very well be a mainstay for the Montreal Canadiens moving forward. Well, uh, and, you know, he's going to be the guy that I think will be there long-term, but I'll tell you what, if you talk to Habs fans, the other guy they hope that's there long-term is Arbor Jackai, who you have to pronounce his name basically backwards. Um, maybe the best name in sports, or nickname in sports, Wi-Fi, because his last yeah, name yeah. looks like a Wi-Fi password. Um, That's right, yeah. I I'll be honest, I haven't seen a ton of him so far, but he's big, he's mean, and when I saw him beat the piss out of Zach Cassian a few <laughs> weeks ago, I thought, the Canadians have a monster on their hands. Who is this guy? Where did he come from? And is he already one of the more popular members of the club amongst the Habs fan base? He really has become a overnight sensation for Montreal fans. Uh, he, he played in the OHL with the Kitchener Rangers and the Hamilton Bulldogs. He actually worked at Costco during COVID uh, to make some uh, ends meet because, again, there was nothing was going on at the time. So he worked at Costco, and then he worked himself up to the Montreal Canadiens organization, earned himself uh, uh, you know, the, the run during training camp to earn himself a run for the team now, and Wi-Fi, as they call him in the locker room. Uh, has really cemented himself. People thought he would have been sent down to Laval with Matheson and Emerson coming back into the fold here. But I think now he probably will make a case for himself to keep himself up with the Montreal organization for the time being because he's physical, he has an edge to his game, and he's not afraid of anybody. He will go at anyone out there, and he's kind of set the warning that, look, Zach Cassidy took a pounding for me. I want Jake Paul next probably and, and go from there. But I think he's really saying to the, to the HL world, look, we're not going to be messed around with, and I'm a guy that you don't want to bleep with because I will mess you up whether it's on the ice or off of it because this dude is a real cool guy but also a badass on the ice. Well, you know, and bringing it back to the Jets for this matchup tonight between uh, Montreal and Winnipeg, there is a former member of this organization playing some significant minutes on that blue line. It's Johnny Kovacevic, and Johnny is a hot topic around here. There's plenty of fans that are – very disappointed as the way the Winnipeg Jets handled their players. Kyle Capabianco was still on the roster uh, at the expense of Kovacevic. And it was more than just the Habs that put a waiver claim in on Johnny. I've been sort of following along. He's getting a solid 17, 18 minutes a night, Mo. Um, how is the uh, former Jet and Moose fitting into Montreal? And uh, is he now a regular? Should we expect him to be on this team, on the blue line regularly throughout the season? I think he's making a case to be a regular. Uh, again, when, when Edmondson and Matheson both come back, uh, Kovacevic might be a guy that might have seen in, in the press box a game or two. He also have Wyman as well. But he's really cemented himself into the flow of things here with Montreal Canadiens. He's really adapted to what they want to build upon here. Uh, he's really mentored the younger guys, right? And he's pretty young himself. And I think moving now towards uh, this now running games in November, uh, it's an opportunity for him to kind of say to the NHL, well, look, if I'm not going to be Montreal long term, I can be somewhere else. And I think Kovacevic has really brought that edge, that sandpaper required from his role, being his number three of Malfoy, number four defenseman on the, on, the, on the blue line as we speak. And now, look, with this game against Winnipeg, he'll probably have a bit more uh, motivation to kind of prove a point to the Jets that you should have passed up on me so quickly. Look where I'm at right now. So I'll be quite fascinated to see how he does tonight against the Jets with the Montreal Canadiens playing in the, in the peg tonight. I saw somebody suggest that he's – probably a lock for his first NHL goal. See, people seem to have all sorts of milestones when they come here. And then especially yeah. with the with the background, it would be uh, it would be interesting. Hoping that doesn't happen. Um, Mo, just before we finish up on uh, the visitors tonight, I have to ask you, what yeah. um, what's the story with Carey Price? Um, he's not retired. Said that he still would like to play. I mean, uh, what do we know about this incredible NHL legend that uh, many people fear has played his last game? Yeah, I think the end is, is probably nearer than, than before. I, I think he knows it. I think he's holding out for that last uh, Hail Mary hope that he could probably come back and play for this organization. But I think the, the reality is he's now probably at a point where he's, he's come to grips that he probably will play professional hockey at the highest level again. And I think moving, moving forward for him, uh, he started to kind of service himself out and about more in the public eye. He was at the Alouettes uh, last home game against the Argonauts a few weeks ago. Uh, and now... The question is, people, we were speculating on, on Hockey.io 
that does he go to management? Does he go to coaching? Uh, does he have that 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 cachet to do either or? And you saw Roberto Luan go to management with the Florida Panthers, and now he's probably on the diving board to become a GM at some point in the next two three years in the NHL. So I think for Carey Price, he's got options out there, but now for him moving forward, I think it's coming to grips that he probably won't be playing in the NHL ever again. And it's too bad because this is a goalie that did really well for the Montreal Canadiens, but could not get the team over the hump to win a Stanley Cup as he always did two years ago. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, last one for the Habs, for people that were triggering talking too much about the visitors tonight. But I find it's a fascinating team, and we're obviously going to be seeing them tonight. Um, you guys still uh, talking about our guy Pierre-Luc Dubois quite a bit in Montreal, or is that sort of quieted down? What, uh, what, what, what are people saying on the show when they bring up PLD here in Winnipeg? It, I told you back in the spring, it was just a fad, right? I mean, because... No one knew what, what the Habs were going to do. And, and now they kind of have figured out. I think Slavikovsky could be their Dubois in terms of his size and style of play that he brings on the ice. And maybe Dubois comes in two years. Who knows? But I, I, it's not going to happen now. It will happen at the deadline. Maybe next summer. Who knows? But I think now for Montreal fans, they're, they're okay with what, where the direction is of this franchise. And if Pierre-Luc Dubois is available and they have the, the right space from a cap perspective and to where they want to fit in the scheme, Maybe he does become a Montreal Canadian, but again, as I told you before, I had I had a doubt it will happen anytime soon with the way things have been built up for this team move towards uh, next summer for the draft and of course free agency. All right, Habs and Jets tonight. We're going to hear from Rick Bonus right away. We'll break it down the lineup and more with Brandon Rewicki coming up in a few minutes here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. But while we've got my guy Mo here. Next couple of weeks, I think we coast to coast in Canada are going to be hearing a lot more about our men's national team, the return to the World Cup for the first time since 1986. It has not been, like, it literally since Canada qualified for the World Cup, it has been <laughs> the rockiest of roads for Canada, Mo. Um, wh where are things at right now with the players, with the Canada soccer, Canada soccer business? Um, you know, I, I want to get so excited for this event, and I am. But, man, it's been tough for Canadian fans, and I think a lot of the players, considering so many of the stories around the team over the past month have been really negative and almost embarrassing. Yeah, well, let's clear something up here, right? Would Nike be the sponsor of Team Canada? If you are a Team Canada fan, you are happy that they didn't change the uniform because if you look at the Nike kits for the World Cup, they're god-awful for USA and others. They're terrible. So if you're a Canada fan... Be happy that it's stayed as is because it is a much better look than what's going to be presented on in Qatar in a few weeks from now. Now, look, the reality is with this CSA is that they kind of caught themselves in cement because they didn't realize that, oh, the momentum would be generated from this team, that people are going to want to be a part of it and want to be you know involved from a merchandise perspective and the value that each player brings. Uh, Fountain Davies, with all due respect to the women's team, which has done remarkably well uh, for this program for many years here. Davies has a bigger cachet, and that's where I think he was kind of saying, look, guys, I'm bringing a few more sales for your uniform. Why can't I get a bigger piece of the pie? I just think now for the CSA, for the men's and women's, they have to pay them equally and make sure that they're fairly compensated because if they're not, and this hovers over to the Women's World Cup next summer, and that's where I think for, for Team Canada, for the CSA, they got to make sure things are going to be kumbaya before Qatar. If not, it might create more question marks going towards 2023. How, uh, how different do you think the organization, I mean, my God, we've been talking about Hockey Canada blowing everything up for different reasons. Um, are they going to do the same thing on the soccer side once this World Cup is finished? I mean, how much change could we be seeing? How much, in your opinion, how much change needs to happen to continue us moving forward as a soccer nation and being a team that will be contending in women's World Cups repeatedly and more of yeah. a presence on the men's scene? Well, I think, the key is the investment of the money that they will get from the FIFA World Cup for men's and women's in the next 12 months here, Andrew. How will this be allocated? Because if it's going to be allocated towards the wrong avenue, it's going for naught. Because remember, Canada will, will probably automatically qualify for the World Cup in 2026 with the way the format will be changed up in, in four years from now. But this is where you have to kind of grow it. And this is where you have to look at yourselves in the mirror and ask the CSA, are you properly allocating the funds towards the provinces and towards the soccer clubs across Canada to make sure that they're developing their players properly. Because if they're not, we're going backwards again. And we don't want that to happen for this nation because we're in a window of, of so many young, talented players come up through the pipe system, whether it's male or female, that they might say to themselves, hey, I got dual citizenship somewhere else. 
well, guess what? I'll go play for that country because you know what? They got better funding, better programs, and let me go play somewhere else because I don't want to be in CSA where they may not you support us. Because, Andrew, think about this right now. 10, 12 years ago, the CSA was probably at a point where they didn't really have the funds to really support this. And now they get all this money through the coffers and they don't know what to do with it. And they got to figure this out ASAP hmm. because they don't want to be caught, you know, again, cement feet, not be, be proactive with what they want to do for this program for men's and women's and trying to grow it moving towards the next four or five years. Well, exactly. I think everyone could agree on that. They need to be uh, managed better, take advantage of the incredible perf performances by our athletes. I mean, I still regret when the women won the gold um, last time out, it was during COVID. There was no opportunity to go and have a big cross-country celebration the way the women in the United States did after winning their World Cup. And, you know, that was circumstances, I think, prevented an incredible opportunity to continue to grow both the game and the profile of those athletes. Um, we're in a different situation right now. And, you know, and again, it's a weird time. I mean, hockey's going to be going on, football's going to be going on, but this is going to be huge for Canadians. And um, hopefully it's the start of a just a whole leaving everything in the in the background and in the rearview mirror and moving on to a new time for Canadian soccer. Outside of all the off-field stuff, Mo, we got some friendlies coming up. Just give us a quick, for people that haven't been following the team, What's going on right now? I heard John Herdman talk about, you know, they still have to figure out who the final roster is going to be the World Cup. Yeah. What's yeah, happening yeah. over the next uh, week or so before they actually get to Doha? When will we know who's wearing the red and white in uh, in the well, Middle East? We'll know in the next week and a half uh, with who will be on this roster. I think uh, Herdman wants to pray to the soccer gods that no one else gets hurt. You see across the board, so many top end players are going down before the World Cup, which is terrible uh, for the World Cup itself. So Herman will, will probably decide his roster, I think, in the next 10 days. And then from there, you got to build it up. And the problem is, though, with this being smack dab in the eye of the European soccer season, it really offsets what you're trying to build up here. Because in a normal World Cup preparation, you have three, four weeks. Now you have probably like a week and a half to get things organized for your first game in Qatar in a few weeks from now. Mo, great stuff. Uh, always love having you on the program. And we'll have to do this again closer to, uh, to kick off in Qatar. Uh, but fill people in. I know... There's probably a few closet Habs fans, or at least people that would like to keep track of what you're doing on Hockey Inside Out. Fill people in on uh, where they can find the content uh, when it's coming out. Yeah, Hockey Inside Out, uh, it's every week. We film it on Wednesday, and it's posted up Thursday on YouTube, so you can like it, uh, Hockey Inside Out. Also, subscribe to the uh newsletters for Hockey Inside Out. We got bonus content as well. Uh, it's Rick Green, former NHL player, Andrew Berkshire, who did cover the Jets uh, a couple years ago. It's Stu Count, who's uh, who's uh, the Habs beat writer for the Montreal Gazette, and myself. And we go at it for one hour, breaking down the Habs, uh, the week that was and the week that will be for them. So it's a lot of fun working with these guys. And our next uh, our ex episode should be up now as you speak, but every Thursday it will be posted up uh, on all Habs talk uh, from top to bottom. Appreciate it, Mo. Thanks so much for doing this. Have a good one and enjoy this game tonight. I will, my friend. I just got to get over this sinus infection. And once I do, I'll be A-OK -okay for this weekend and for the game tonight as well. <laughs> you grinded it through, man. Great to do it. And uh, thanks so much for your, your time. Always appreciate it. There it is, our guy Always Mo Khan. Fo follow him on Twitter, at MoCon19. And, uh, yeah, definitely check out Hockey Inside Out. Got a great panel. And, uh, obviously, Mo, would always. This is the flow show, actually, today. We've got Mo. And then Brandon Rewicki, definitely number one and two on the WST hair power poll ever. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Anyways, thanks again to Mo. We are going to hear from Rick Bonus right away. Um, well, you know what? Let's get to it. And I, I, I sort of went over this quickly. But, I mean, the big news, and Rick will talk about this shortly, is Morgan Barron is out, not just out tonight, but out four to five weeks with wrist surgery. That was part of the reason why Jansen Harkins was called up on an emergency basis. Now, Hark was skating after the morning skate today. So there is the potential that he won't be in the lineup, but it sounds like there could be another player that is a game time decision. Of course, Mason Appleton, who's still scheduled to play and be on that Connor Shifley line, was not there this morning. So I would imagine that maybe it's touch and go. He left practice with illness a couple days ago. Um, so if Appleton cannot go, you would imagine that um, the Jansen, Har Jansen Harkins will go in there. And then the question is, you know, is it Sam Gagne? I would think Sam Gagne might be the most logical guy to move up with Shifley and Connor. He showed so much versatility so far. And then have Harkins play with Adam Lowry and Saku Menelainen on that third line. 
Um, Dominic Toninato right now, as it looks, coming out of the morning skate, is going to be on the left side of the fourth line with Gus and uh, Axel Janssen fjolby and staying with Perfetti, Dubois, and Wheeler, which we'll hear from in a minute. So well, we'll get to Coach Rick Bonus in just a second, and then we'll talk about it coming up with Brandon Ruwicki. Um, that being said, let me just get right to the why not question of the day. Um, if Mason Appleton is out, and it doesn't look like Nick Ehlers is coming back anytime soon, outside of Appleton, who would your number one choice be to play alongside Shifley and Connor, assuming that Rick Bonus is keeping those two players uh, together? Um, certainly, Blake Wheeler would be a player that would be in the mix. Cole Perfetti could potentially move there onto the other side. Sam Gagne, I think, is potentially my choice right now if it is on a shorter term. I'm not sure he's got the wheels maybe to keep up with those guys, but he's such a smart player and has shown that you know he can finish off on opportunities and quite responsible as well. So that's where I'm at. But hit us up in the comments, your thoughts, and certainly in the chat. Um, we'd love to get your, hear back, uh, your feedback on all of that. Of course, not Autocorp. Great sponsors of ours and uh, the uh, bringing you the why not question of the day each and every day. Uh, lots going on at why not at not not AutoCorp as well. They're the Tesla experts right now. And if you're thinking about an electric vehicle, talk to them about overnight or weekend long Tesla experience as part of that Tesla experience program to learn everything about electric vehicles and technology from the Tesla experts. And don't forget, gang, we're still dry right now, but the snow will be here sooner than later. And it's always better to have your winter tires on and ready to go. And if you don't have the scratch for it, well, there's an MPI payment plan and winter tire specials right now at Not Auto Corp. Why not get safe winter tires now and pay later? You can do that today by calling the folks at Not or pop down and see them at Waverly and McGillivray. And of course, information on the car lab, detailing their consignment programs, all available online at not.ca. Um, our boys at Royal Sports are ready to go. We've got uh, West Final coming up in uh, less, well, but a week and a half. New bomber gear is in. Tukes, scarfs, and more. Probably perfect for uh, what's coming up on uh, on the 13th. Excuse me. Uh, not only that, but uh, if you need to maybe update your Jets gear, that's the place to do it too. Now, they're still waiting on the retro reverse jerseys. I imagine those will be out in about the next week. I think we're going to see them for the first time on the weekend. Uh, but for those of you that want to pick one of those up, we'll certainly have them at Royal Sports as well. Uh, and it's much more than just Jets and Bomber gear. Tons of Canada soccer gear. Just talking about the upcoming World Cup with Mo Khan, NBA, National Football League, Major League Baseball. It's all there. And, of course, Royal is the hockey superstore for over 40 years in town and a great roster of hockey players working for Royal to help you get the best fit, the best equipment for the hockey player in your family from sticks, from full goalie equipment, right down to skate sharpening. It's all there at Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway and online on Instagram, I should say, at Royal Sports Pemina. Give them a follow for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And, you know, back in the day, we might have done, we might have done our suit day, our suit show today if Remus was here, because of course, back in the day in 1.0, when the Habs came to town, it was tuxedo night. Now I was young enough. I certainly was not wearing a tux to any of those games, but I do remember some very well-dressed fans. If you need to step up your wardrobe game, folks, whether it's for a game or whether it's for day to day, F apparel is the spot. Andrew and his great staff leaders in custom suits and clothing for men with suits beginning at just $400. The entire process is easy. You go down there, get measured, pick your colors, styles, fabrics. In a few weeks, you got a beautiful new suit at a great price from F Apparel. Couple specials on right now. Buy one suit, get one 30% off. And for those of you that are involved in a wedding party coming up next summer, if you get the guys down to F Apparel, get booked and get measured and uh, all that before the end of November, Everyone in the wedding party will get a free shirt and you'll get 10% off your orders. You could save up to $130 per person and hell of a lot better than uh, dropping a few hundred bucks to rent something for the weekend and then have to give it back. Find out more at F Apparel, 190 Smith Street downtown, and you can book an appointment or find out more online at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. 
All right. We're going to break it down with Brandon Rowicki coming up in a few minutes, but um, lots to get to from the coach earlier today on Morgan Barron's status for the game. Jansen Harkins, where he might be, is Dominic Toninato coming back in, as well as starting off this homestand on a winning note after uh, probably a very difficult three games watching the way his team played, although Connor Hellebuck bailed him out with five or six points on the road. Here's Rick Bonus from just an hour or so ago down at Canada Life Centre preparing his squad tonight for the visit of the Montreal Canadiens. Rick, uh... I don't know, you know, in previous stops in Ottawa, Vancouver, uh, uh, and of course we saw it here the, that Saturday against Toronto, but the uh, the original six divided house syndrome, uh, you know, that, that happens here in Winnipeg a lot, uh, and, and I'm guessing you're expecting it uh, tonight in Montreal, or with Montreal here rather. Uh, is it a different kind of vibe going into the game uh, in a scenario like this? No, no, I mean, you expect it now. The same thing, it was seven years in Vancouver. Toronto, Montreal came in, it was 50 50. So, you know, that's part of the, that's part of it. That's, uh, it should not have any effect on the, how we play today. So, you expect that when you come, you know, the Canadian cities in the original six come in. So, it's not a big deal. What about some of the American uh, venues that you, you coached in? Was there, Anything like that with a U.S. versus U.S. Yeah, team? Yeah, no. When we were in Boston, wherever we went in Boston, there's always a huge following. Is it? Is that's only the original six team I've coached. But whenever we went, there was a huge following, in the, no matter the, the rink. So it's the same for all the Canadian teams. When they came into Phoenix and the American cities I've built, and there's always been a strong following for the original six, no matter who. Yeah, with all of them. So that's and which is good. There's passionate for fans out there for our game, and we gotta love that, man. And then just uh, in terms of uh, housekeeping, uh, Morgan Barron and Mason Appleton uh, not out there. What are their... No, uh, Morgan Barron's going to have an operation tomorrow on his wrist, and he's probably out four to five weeks. Uh, Mason, we expect to play tonight. Any update on Ehlers? He said he went to uh, the doctor yesterday or something like that. Ehlers? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, it's, it's, you know what? It's improving. It's, it's improving slower than we had hoped, but it is improving. Um, so, you know, to put a timeline on it, no, but at least there's progress. And we'd hope, we would hope that it was going to come around quicker. It's not, but there is progress. Toninato or Harkins, which one is going in tonight? Uh, Toninato ton, ton will go in. Harkins will take warm-up because we've got a few guys that are banged up a little bit and not feeling great, so Harks will take warm-up just in case. And just to clarify on Morgan, was this something that happened during the last game, or it had been he had been dealing with it? He's and it been dealing with it. Practice the yeah. other day, or no? He's just been dealing with it, and you you, you know it's a small bone in there, and he, the more you play with it, and the more it gets aggravated, and you 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 know for the the team he was sucking it up and playing through it, but there comes a point where it affects the way you play. Now you're not nearly as effective, and you now you feel like you're hurting the team. So let's get it fixed. Coach, uh, I had a look on your RKDB page, and uh, there's 40 years between the Sherbrooke Jets and the Winnipeg Jets <laughs> today. Uh, You're going to bring that up, eh? <laughs> <laughs> how, how proud are you to, be, to still be in a business? Uh, is it passion, dedication? What um, is this? I don't know. Like, and David knows this as well. Every day in this league is a blessing, man. It is. And and you can never, ever take a day in this league for granted. And I never have. So I've, I've kind of, I don't know if I've ever looked at it. I'm proud of I don't look at it like that. I looked at it. I'm very, very fortunate right, to, have, to have worked this long in the league, to have been around the league as long as I have. I'm very, very fortunate. But I've never taken a day for granted in this league. Uh, I'm certainly not the smartest guy in the league. But um, I have... The passion has kept me going. That's what it is, and uh, uh, and it'll keep me going. We're not done yet. What stood out from the first nine-game block for you? Um, encouraging, and um, there's also recognition of. I, I just and I, I see it. You know, so I've certainly noticed on the television. I see when things don't go well, we go back into bad habits. That's and that's what. We, but we knew that coming in. That it was, it was going to take time. You, there's times during the game you you see how we want to play. Then there's times in the game um, that we're chasing the game way too much. 
and we the, and then when they're chasing the game you get tired you go back into your bad habits so that's what we're that's what we're trying to change are we encouraged that we're sitting here at five three and one at three three at home and six on the road yeah are we well aware that we have to play better and we can that's the encouraging thing yeah we are so we'll take where we are uh, with an understanding and the players we had a great talk about this the other day we have to play better and we do and, and we can that's the encouraging thing so it's a matter of, of, of playing to the, the, our expectations and our standards on a more consistent basis but when we get into trouble it's when I see us creep back into those old habits and we're watching and we're chasing the game too much so when you see that then you know we're trying <laughs> those are the things we're trying to change well, I just had a very interesting comment on on what you're talking about there, and that you know points rule here. Like it's a it's Absolutely. you need results, right? And so if you're getting results but you're not quite following the process that you want them following, it can be kind of tough and pull you in either direction because you got to get the points, and it's it's tricky to leave that behind the way you're playing, getting those points to go play what you're playing. How do you strike that balance between the two? You never you never complain about the win. But you always have to be honest on your assessment of how you played. And, and, and that's the biggest message that we will send them. Like, as I mentioned the other day, there'll be games that you just play great and, and you lose. Goalie stands on his head, you're hitting posts. That stuff happens. There's been games we've played poorly and your goalie bails you out. That's going to happen again. Uh, so th those things already two games will balance themselves out. The most important thing from game to game is you assess how you played and good or bad regardless of the outcome the process is the is the important thing and if you take care and we all coaches we all say the same things i, I get that but it but it's very true so we we've focused more we fo we're so we're not going in there and yelling and screaming over playing lousy after we win a game we're not doing that but we're very honest with them about our assessment of the game this is where we have to play better this is where the areas this can't continue uh, and they're well aware of it the guys are well aware but they care they they care what's going on out there um so it's it's the assessment of uh, the honest assessment of how you play the game it's like me coming to you guys after we give up 16 shots and say wow did we ever have a good first period no, that's not right. You guys are watching the same game. But um, so it's the assessment. It's the honest assessment. And that's what we deal with with the players. Rick, I, sorry. I, I, know, I know from your comments yesterday you don't put a lot of value in morning game day skates. Um, do you put value in the fact that you tell your players they don't need to come out and they keep coming out anyway? Well, the game day player does what he needs to do to get ready. The coach can't tell him what to do to get ready. You have to get ready. That's your job. As I mentioned it the other day, your job as a professional athlete, you control your work ethic, you control your preparation. So if you want to go on, go on. Even if we had a full team uh, skate planned, if somebody came up to me and said, I don't, you know, I don't think I need to skate, I'd say, fine, stay off the ice. The day of a game is the player. It's the athlete's day. Let them prepare the way they need to prepare. Uh, because then I'm taking away all the any excuses. Well, I, well, I didn't want to skate and you made me skate. I'm, not, I'm eliminating all excuses on this. So when we have an option, if they think they need to go out, go out. If a day of a game, if again, if, if they don't think they should go out and they came to me and said, I don't Perfect. think I need to skate, fine. <coughs> but, but you know when the puck drops tonight, you better be ready. Rick, I know yesterday you said you really like what the fourth <laughs> line has done and that's the one line that's kind of consistently, you know, getting the maybe the team going in the right direction so with Morgan out do you move someone up to the third line yeah, or gonna, does Dominic just go straight in there no so. we're gonna move Saku up with with Lowry and we'll move Dominic in with the Gus all right there's coach Rick Bone has some real interesting comments from Bones who's gonna be back on the ice and back behind the bench tonight only the second time this season had the uh, one game against the Montreal Canadiens or once again, the Toronto Maple Leafs. And now the other Canadian original six team coming to town as the uh, Montreal have uh, Montreal Canadians in town tonight. All right. We're going to chop it up with Brandon or before we do that. Just got to give a big thanks to our friends, the Nick and Nikki DQ group for the great support of Winnipeg sports talk since day one. If you're craving the best ice cream treat around, you got to pop into one of the four Nick and Nikki DQs for one of their amazing blizzards. DQ Northgate, DQ Niverville, 
DQ Polar Park and DQ St. Anne's. You can also find them on your favorite delivery app as well. If you're maybe looking for a little munch or a refreshing treat while you're watching the game tonight, <clears throat> and don't forget those stack burgers as well. Unbelievable. And if you're th needing a DQ ice cream cake for an upcoming event, let Nick and Nikki get it ready for you. Hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba, and they'll have that sucker ready for you, custom made for a quick and easy pickup at any of the four Nick and Nikki DQs. And hey, Thursday night, Habs in town. If you're not heading to the game, you know what might go well with the game? Maybe a case of Winnipeg's favorite local brew, 1919, from our friends at Little Brown Jug. But of course, we know Little Brown Jug's far more than just their flagship 1919 brand. A brand new Good Times variety pack is available right now. You can find out more online at littlebrownjug.ca or the best way to do it, Pop on down for yourself at their beautiful brewery and tap room on William Avenue. Try them all and take your favorites home along with maybe a little bit of Little Brown Jug merchandise. Uh, but if you're not able to get downtown, you can always order for citywide delivery at littlebrownjug.ca or pick up the best of Little Brown Jug at your local beer store or liquor marts. Take it from us. It is the good stuff, and uh, we'll make that game tonight. Hopefully, maybe a good victory beer for the fellas afterwards tonight if they can beat the Montreal Canadiens. All right, let's get to it. We just heard from Rick Bonus. Let's talk more Jets heading into tonight with Brandon Rowicki, the host of Skates and Plates. Find it wherever you get your favorite podcast. Brandon, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing pretty good, man. How's it going? Well, it's going well. Um, I'm very intrigued to see what we get out of the Jets tonight. Um, considering what we saw from them on the road. And much like we just heard from Rick Bonus, we've heard from a number of players. The sound bites are very different around the Winnipeg Jets. I'll say that. I mean, Kyle Connor saying straight up it's unsustainable. Mark Shifley agreeing with him. I mean, they were is sort of a sheepish five of six points, which on paper is great when you consider tough games in Vegas and in uh, and in LA. But I think we can all agree that this team can play much, much better. I guess what was frustrating about it was that came off their far and away best game of the yeah. year with that full 60-minute performance against the St. Louis Blues. We spoke a week today going, I guess we'll see what we'll get against the LA Kings. Well, what we got was Connor Hellebuck playing like the best goalie in the history of the game and uh, a bunch of guys that were maybe more passengers. Uh, what did you make of the 5-6 of six road trip and what we heard from the Winnipeg Jets heading into tonight? Yeah, you know, if they would have found a way to win in the shootout against Vegas, that might have been the worst three and zero road trip in NHL history. And they just didn't they didn't play good. I, I I think outside of maybe the the latter half of the third period against Arizona, I didn't like their game at all. I mean, they were dominated pretty much start to finish, albeit a, a few shifts in the third period against the Kings, but start to finish against LA and Vegas, and they weren't really all that imposing either against. Arizona. I mean, we're, we're kind of used to Vimelka being Dominic Hasek for the Coyotes when he plays the Jets, but he was he was fine, but he didn't have to be anything crazy. It was it, it was it's just bizarre, right? Because you pick up five of six, which is an awesome result on any three game road trip, but it almost feels like the team took a step back in a way, right? So I'm not not really sure how to feel about the team. I guess I mean positive in the sense that the players are cognizant of the fact that they didn't deserve their 2 on one record. That's great. Bones continues to win behind the microphone as he has all season long. And so at least, you know, the message is the proper one right now. And that, look, it's, it's, if you're going to play bad, I guess, get the points instead of losing. But yeah, there, there needs to be a number of areas that are short up extremely quickly here because it's just, it's beyond unsustainable. And I mean, Hey, you play like that against, Teams like Montreal and Arizona, even, you're not going to win all that many games, let alone teams like LA and Vegas and some other playoff caliber clubs in the West. Well, you're exactly right. And I mean, listen, bottom line is, I mean, you're happy with where the team is, but everyone watched the games. And that's why Rick Bonus's approach, at least to us, and presumably he's saying the same thing to the players, is so refreshing. And I mean, I hate to... It, we inevitably get into a big thing where we're comparing him to the old guy who was here for so long. Um, but honestly, I mean, if you want to establish accountability, you need to be frank and honest with your players. And listen, I'm not sure that it matters that much as far as to the players as to what he's saying publicly. But the players have kind of responded to that as well. And 
We're going to find out what we get out of this team tonight after a couple days of practice, knowing that they need to be much, much better. Um, you can say all the right things, but it only matters what you do on the ice. But it's part of the reason why I expect a much better game tonight and hopefully something a little closer to the St. Louis game. Um, I mean, they should play a little guilty. I mean, they sort of got busted or they got away with a couple things. Everyone knows it. Now you got a Montreal Canadiens team coming in. It ain't the Kings. It sure as heck ain't the uh, the Vegas Golden Knights. And um, time to start this road trip off on a good uh, on a good foot. Well, it's pretty hard when you pick up a point to get embarrassed, but the Jets got embarrassed against Vegas. They, 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 they at least should feel that way, right? Because they were awful. The Golden Knights were by far the superior team throughout the game. So I look the one thing that's bothered me in the past about some of the things we've heard from the coaches and, and things like that is there's been excuses all the time, right? Like, oh, the Jets travel is brutal. Oh, injuries. Oh, this, 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 this. Yet other teams go through similar things and they find ways to win and, and doing so without complaining. This next stretch of four games is is really, I think, what I'm going to put a lot of stock into as to how I think the Jets are going to be this year. Uh, there's no excuses anymore, right? You had, I mean, four days of rest, four days in between games from your last matchup, you start off at home here with a couple of quote unquote cupcakes on your schedule. And then a couple of games against some, some really good teams so far this season, this, this should be the opportunity to prove yourself if you're Winnipeg and your head coach is finally back behind the bench as well. So I I'm going to look, it, it was, it was just, it was tough to watch at times in the, in that road trip for the jets, they picked up the points. So that's great. I'll, I'll still, you know, if they find a way to go, say, 3-0-1 through this stretch of four games, I'll I'll feel pretty good about their chances moving forward for the rest of the year. But if they kind of stumble and we see more of the same struggle to break out of your own zone, inability to protect the front of your net, just hanging on for dear life and hoping Connor Hellebuck grabs you two points, if we see that consistently through these four games, with Bones back behind the bench, with a rested group after that, it's going to be tough to muster up a whole lot of optimism on their playoff chances this year. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Um, that being said, we're talking about a first place hockey team right now, Brent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I guess Dallas has won a game since, but um, you know, they put themselves, they, well, Connor Hellebuck in some ways and some other games, the team as well, they put themselves in a position that, I mean, what did we want? We wanted them to survive the first 10 games and really it was more the first nine games and the 10th game was this game against the Montreal Canadiens. And I just think, to, to your exact point, it's imperative that this team gets back on track, plays the way the coaching staff is trying to get them to play, um, and come up with a great performance, and maybe get a few goals for Connor Hellebuck so he can relax. I just think more and more about that Blues game, you know, last Monday, in that it was tight. I mean, they scored midway through the game. They didn't get a two-goal lead until 10 minutes left. But the way they played in the second and third period, they actually ramped up their pressure on the opposing goaltender. And, I mean, he had a 25-save shutout where I believe 14 of the shots were in the first period. So they know what they can do. We'll see what we get tonight. Let's talk about the lineup for a minute, B. Um, obviously, really tough news for Morgan Barron. I, I liked his start. I thought he was getting some scoring chances. He had scored. Wrist injury takes him out four to five weeks um, what do you think that does to the Lowry line? And what makes sense? If you were putting out the lineup card, how do you work the lineup without a guy that, you know, with Mason's Appleton's absence had really sort of been the guy riding shotgun with Adam Lowry, who's played quite well as of late? Yeah, well, what stands out to me is this kind of illustrates Chevy's inactivity this offseason in terms of finding some reinforcements here because – you're not even 10 games into the season and you've got an injury in the top six, injury in the bottom six, and all of a sudden you're trying to, to scramble and put something together. Having said that, though, it's it's been the bottom six that's been really impressive so far this season. They haven't gotten a ton of production outside of Mark Shifley in the top six so far. So it, it, it sucks because you like the way your bottom six was playing, but now you kind of got to reshuffle that a little bit. You're leaning on Mason Appleton to create some offense on the top line. That's that. I mean, that experiment has gone pretty poorly so far. So I don't know. I, I honestly, one of the most impressive Jets for me has been Mr. Brightside, Sam Gagne. I wouldn't mind giving him a shot up there on the top line with with Shifley and Connor. I, I think Gagne's been a tremendous pickup. Like that. That's kind of the guy you want when you when you grab a vet with a month to go before the season. He's delivering exactly what you want out of somebody like that, and I, I wouldn't mind 
giving him a, a, a couple of shifts with some talented players mm-hmm. up there on that top line. Plus, I think, you know, shifting Mason Appleton back down to the third line, that's probably where he's best suited at this point. And, and he had some good games early on with uh, with Adam Lowry down the middle there. So I, I would probably lean towards that move. Um, but it, it does kind of, again, put a bit of a focus back on, and I know Elliot Friedman touched on this in his 32 thoughts, that, you know, a bit of a logjam on defense. Yes, there's some injuries, but, you know, at some point here, if the Jets get a little more banged up up front, yeah. You're going to have to pull the trigger at some point here to to bring some reinforcements because, yeah, you know, you wouldn't maybe necessarily think it, but production so far has been kind of scarce for the Winnipeg Jets, specifically outside of Mark Shifley in that top six. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll, you know, I know we talked about these Elliot Friedman comments earlier on, but, I mean, you know, there certainly has been lots of talk, but, you know, Cheval Dayoff doesn't want to trade if he's not going to get his price. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people that we respect that. You don't want to make a trade just for the sake of doing it. The thing, Brandon, that has really stood out to me and I think maybe highlights why the Jets have not made a move involving one of their defensemen is what the costs are. I mean, what did Ethan Bear? Ethan Bear got Carolina a fifth, uh, fifth round pick. I mean, Ethan Bear to me is a quality NHL defenseman that can play in your top six night in and night out. If the going rate for that is a fifth round pick, maybe we kind of see why Kevin Chevalier has been a little bit tight. But now is the time to basically be creative, to work the phones and find because there will be other teams that have different situations i'm still stunned and maybe i'll get your comments on the market right now and what we learned from the bear trade um and what that means for winnipeg who you know i think has confidence in the players that they've got in the roster but everyone would agree and i'm sure kevin sheveled up that they would love to have another forward that they could play in the middle six at minimum yeah i mean i don't know if if we're comparing ethan bear to say brandon dillon for example or, or something like that You know, Dylan's playing a top four role. Ethan Bear was kind of the odd man out in Carolina. And with them kind of lodged up near the salary cap, it was almost more of a cap casualty move, I thought at least. But I agree. I mean, hey, for for a fifth round pick, I'll take it Ethan Bear every single day of the week. I I have to imagine, though, with, I mean, and and there's going to be injuries at some point, too. I have to imagine that there still is a decent market out there for, uh, any one of the Jets defenders that they could be throwing out there to, to grab a forward. I, I just, I, I refuse to believe that there's only mid to late round picks available for somebody that could play 18, 19 minutes a night for you. Um, I, I just, what what I'm intrigued by is it, it just, it feels like teams aren't willing to meet the demands of Kevin Chevalier up yet. Well, what are those demands? That That's the, that's kind of the, the real thing that we need to find an answer to, right? Because if he's asking for something reasonable, then can kind of understand why he's been hesitant to pull the trigger. But if it's, I want a second line forward for one of my guys, then yeah, you are being a bit unreasonable and maybe lower that down to try to get this team some immediate help right now because they need it. And I don't know. I I've made the point before. I, I, I think this team has enough good defensemen. If you can call it that, you know, maybe second to third pair D men. We we're seeing Dylan Sandberg play some really good hockey. That was one of the big bright spots for the road trip for me is that, you know, Sandberg finally getting back in. It seems like he's kicked off some of the rust in the in the early season. Well, and he got leaders. way I, better I, through it. I mean, did you? I don't know about you, but I thought he was pretty shaky in the L.A. game, and he certainly had a ton of company. I mean, he was basically you're, you're rocking into a fire drill, basically what what that was. But man, Brandon, I mean, I thought he was pretty calm in the Vegas game, and even though Vegas again carried the play and was all over the Winnipeg Jets. There were a number of situations, two in particular I can remember, where he made really nice cross-ice passes from the blue line, setting up members of the Winnipeg Jets for quality chances on goal. And, you know, we think of him more as sort of a stay-at-home defenseman, but he really does look like a guy that the more he plays at this level, the more comfortable he gets, and he's showcasing more of what he brings to the Winnipeg Jet blue line. Yeah, the, the, hey, the first period in L.A. was nightmare fuel. Right? I mean, you basically gift wrap the Kings of Gold <laughs> Good, and it well didn't put. get much better from there. Yeah, I, I mean, look, and again, a lot of company in, in L.A. But I, I do agree in Vegas, while there was a lot of company making a lot of mistakes, I didn't think he was one of them. I thought he was he was their best blue liner against the Golden Knights and, and kind of acquitted himself well despite dealing with the constant onslaught of chance after chance. So, I look, I, I feel pretty comfortable giving Dylan Sandberg a spot on the second pair. I, I don't really have much issue with that to me. 
There, there's two main issues that come on the blue line for the Jets, in my opinion. One is just the log jam that we've talked about, you know, nonstop for about three or four months now. And, and at some point that needs to be fixed. But the other part of that is, and it's a lot more tricky and, and difficult to, to pull off is, you know, I, I still think they're one big time significant piece on the blue line away from, from really starting to enter the playoff lock discussion among some of the other teams that are out there. I, I To me, that's been evident. There, there's been some bright spots on the blue line for sure. I don't think the Jets have a bad blue line, but I think if they could somehow find a way to, and I don't know if he's out there right now or if it's going to take a year, but if they can find a way to grab a guy that can be a top pair D-man for them, a legitimate top pair D-man, it just lessens the load so much on so many of the guys that are maybe being asked to do too much right now. And, and that, to me, it, it's kind of part and parcel where you need to figure out some of the depth issues on this team up front, but you also need to find a way to alleviate the log jam on the back end. But, you know, at the same time, let's try and find a stud that we can bring in ASAP. Well, and, and you know what? And that stud number one defenseman is something that so many teams covet. Many teams don't have it. And listen, with all due respect to Josh Morrissey and Neil Pionk and the guys on the Jet Blue Line right now, they don't have that elite alpha number one defenseman right now. And, you know, it's funny with the Habs in town tonight. And obviously he's not at that point right now. But, you know, I did hear in the summer and even at the end of last season, some scuttlebutt about, you know, when the Habs were talking about and we were talking about potentially, you know, what would a Pierre-Luc Dubois trade look like? And Nick Suzuki was the guy. The other player that we heard the name uh, mentioned a number of times was a guy that hadn't even played yet in Caden Gooley. And, you know, he had a monster season last year in the Western Hockey League. Got a chance to see him in person at the Ice Cave playing for the Oil Kings. Um, that is a guy that, you know, you know, listen, you would love to have a player like that. And is he a number one defenseman right now? Well, no, although he's playing top line minutes for Montreal. And I think we're going to get a chance to see just how talented this young guy is. But man, I mean, if you can get a player like that, especially on an ELC to come in and perform the way he is, that is how you set yourself up for a nice run of competence and excellence on the blue line. And right now the Jets are trying to get that level. And I'm not suggesting that Gooley's the player right now, but it could be a guy that's established. It could be through a trade, a player that has that potential to make it happen. And holy smokes, is he showing what that potential is right now in his rookie season? Well, remember that first preseason game too against against Winnipeg where he comes in right off the bench and just goes top cheddar. It's like, oh, this I think this guy's gonna make the team out there in Montreal. And he's been tremendous so far. <laughs> But it's funny because we're kind of in this golden age of defensemen right now. I mean, Colorado's got – they've got top pair defensemen falling out of their pockets all over the place. But a lot of the higher-end clubs in the league right now have that number one guy. And it's just kind of jarring. I, I, to me, that's just – it's the biggest difference I see between the Jets and, and some of the, the teams that are above them right now in, in, in the power rankings is just that they can lean on a number one guy or, or maybe even two guys – and the Jets have have Josh Morrissey, who I think is a is a, a good first pair defenseman, but I think he's best situated as a as a number two. Neil Pionk, not a top pair defenseman, best situated on the second unit. You know what I mean? Like, and so that's where that one guy can come in and kind of properly slot everybody in after that. So it it, it really comes down to I guess creativity and maybe taking a risk. You know, Chickren's name has been out there for how long now? That that's it's a risky one, no doubt, because I don't know if any of us know if he's a legitimate top pair number one defenseman, but he could be, and he's young and he's cheap as hell too. Like he checks off a lot of the boxes there. Uh, that's a guy that I, I I would understand Chevy wanted to take a swing at that one for sure. Um, but even some of the the older guys that are out there, I mean, I don't know if cap wise it could work, but Eric Carlson, he, you know he's my guy, but he looks like an MVP candidate right now. That there's there's players out there that I think if you can be aggressive and take a chance, you can go out there and get. I'm I'm just I'm not sold that that Kevin Chevalier necessarily sees his blue line that way, and that he's going to go out there to make the plunge. But I just I, I feel like if the Jets really, we can talk forwards, we can talk this 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 all that. Just really hard to find a team that goes deep, that wins a Stanley Cup, that didn't have that number one dog on the back end. I think it's the number one wish list for this team until they find him. Well, one thing you certainly need to do to win games is score goals. Um, Nikolai Ehlers has been out most of the season, and Kyle Connor has one goal. Um, it is, if I told you that 
beforehand. I don't think we think that this team would be in the situation that they're in. But um, what do you make of the slow start start for KFC? It happens. That, that's kind of it. Like, it happens. I, I, I think, look, I don't think there's anything to it. You know, we saw Austin Matthews go through a similar thing last season. He had, I think, one goal through six or seven games, something like that, and he pops off for 60-plus. It's it, it's just what happens with goal scorers. He's gotten chances. I think he is – I think he's the league leader in terms of expected goals, like negative to what he should be getting. So it's, it's not like the chances aren't there for him. He's shooting the puck a ton. It's just not going in right now. It, it's no different as if this happened in games – 52 to 58 right it's just it happens at the beginning of the season so it puts a little more weight on on both him and and i guess the fan base's expectations but to me we're we're seeing a pretty similar kyle connor to what we saw last year you know he's still a a, an insane goal scoring threat can't play a lick of defense (laughs) he had to bring bring bonus as his hands full on that one but uh yeah i'm I'm not concerned at all so far i i think look it might happen in montreal might happen the next game but i imagine I imagine either the next time we talk or the time we talk after that, that we're talking about Connor has six goals in five games or something like that. And, and this thing just kind of goes past the wayside. But yeah, as, as far as things to worry about for me, Kyle Connor's goal total is maybe at the, maybe like the, the peg up above the bottom at the totem pole. It's probably a big reason why uh, Mark Shifley is in the running for the Cy Young right now with uh, six goals. <laughs> and zero assists right now. It is sort of funny for a guy that we thought was going to really be the playmaker on that line, playing with Nikolai Ehlers, who, as we mentioned, has missed most of the season, and Kyle Connor. Shifley's just been the finisher right now and has yet to get an assist on the season, and a big part of that is how snakebit KFC's been. And you mentioned it. I saw that list of players. And there was all this talk about how snakebit Austin Matthews had been, and justifiably so. He was a minus two in goals four above expected, Kyle Connor was far and away the league leader in a yeah. unfortunate way at minus four. But what that shows is it's not like he's just out there invisible. He's been impactful. He's been part of the game. He's been getting chances. He just hasn't been able to bury them. And I'm with you. I thought he was going to explode on this last road trip. Maybe I was a little premature. Now's the time with some home cooking to get 81 going. Yeah, yeah. Again, I, I just don't think there's there's much to worry about and and that's it right like if it was hey he was expected to score one goal so far then we've got some issues but it's just it happens with goal scorers it happens with home run hitters it happens with touch like there in every sport there's a specific guy where you know they're just inherently streaky it, it just doesn't consistently come out he scores every second game or anything like that at some point here he's going to score 10 goals in 13 games and Nobody's going to be talking about this anymore. To, to me, the bigger issue up front, right? Now, Connor's putting the puck in the back of the net are, are you know, worrisome in terms of results. But to me, it's more so that second line right now where Pierre-Luc Dubois has not been as impactful as he was most of last season. You know, Blake Wheeler is what he is at this point, but, you know, it doesn't seem like we're getting a resurgent Eric Carlson type season out of him. And it's it's been a bit of a slow run for, for even Cole Perfetti these last three or four games. Um, and, and kind of, you know, evident by the, the benching for him in Vegas, not seeing the ice in overtime either, but he's had a a pretty rough go of it, you know, by both the eye test and, and the analytics there. So I, I put a lot more of my worries in the team's second line than I do with, you know, when Kyle Connor's going to kind of break through here. Well, I'm with you on that. And we're going to hear from Dubois in just a minute. He spoke before the game tonight. So we'll kind of hear what PLD has to say. Um, I'm with you. That line has been inconsistent I think is the best way and you know being the consistency for a young player like Cole Perfetti without a great deal of NHL experience playing in the spot that he is with the players they are in the matchups that they're getting that we know he's got the skills we know he's got the 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 brain he really does have the total package it's the ability to get used to bringing that every single night brand and that is always a challenge for young players and you know, there will be some ups and downs, especially for Perfetti, but he's not alone on that line with some level, just shall we say, some better performances as opposed to others. Yeah, and, and I think he, maybe more than anybody else, might benefit from Nikolai Ehlers' return because we know Nikolai Ehlers has historically driven play in and been able to be the, you know, the carrier of a line on his own. And I, I think Cole Perfetti could use somebody like that right now, somebody that can drive play, 
lessen the load a little bit on him and he can, you know, use his IQ, use his playmaking ability and, and focus on some more minor details as opposed to worrying about being the guy to generate offense on his own on the line. I, I would love to see when Ehlers does come back, um, have a top line of Shifley, Perfetti and Ehlers. You throw Kyle Connor along with Pierre Luc Dubois, where he had, you know, that, that's where he had his most success last year on pace to almost 50 goals. And then you have Blake Wheeler playing the playmaker role beside those two. I I think that's what I would like to see. Um, I don't I don't think I would say I'm worried about Cole Perfetti just yet. Again, it's just kind of the the reality of playing a rookie 19, 20 year old inside a top six role. Sometimes they come into the gate firing, then they fade down the stretch. Sometimes it's a slow start and they kind of find their legs as the season goes along here. Um, but I mean, the goal in Arizona was a beauty, right? Like there, he's, it's not like he's incapable of generating offense it's and a huge been... goal and a huge goal. That was, I mean, let's not forget it was two, nothing. The Coyotes had just gone up. They're coming off that miserable night in LA that they somehow got two points. And to me, much like Gus feeding Lowry for that shorty at the end of the first period to give that them within one, that goal that Perfetti scored, which was all himself. And I mean, that was the perfect, perfect example of his next level hockey sense, knowing where the puck was going to be, reading exactly what the guy was going to do, stealing it, going in and scoring. That was the play, in my opinion, that got them back in the game. And, you know, I thought the Jets were way better in the second and third period than they were in the first. I'm not sure that happens if they don't get that boost from Perfetti. That being said, it's tough to do that night in and night out. That's the big challenge for him. But he's certainly not alone in that category right now for the Winnipeg Jets. Just before we go, how impressed have you been with the Gus bus and uh, what the fourth line's yeah. been able to do? Uh, like they, They've been great. They've been getting more ice time. And I'll tell you what, especially on the road trip, and maybe it was because of just you know what the other guys weren't doing, Scott O'Neill was not afraid to put those guys out in some pretty high leverage situations in important times of the game that frankly just would not have happened under previous regimes. Yeah, you know, I, I got nursery rhymes pumping all the time in here with my little one, but the, the wheels on the Gus bus, they're, they just keep on churning, man. I, I've, I've been a huge fan. I, he's, he's kind of pleasantly surprised me. There's, there's more offense out of him than I, might have anticipated watching him in in preseason and, and a few regular season games for the Jets these these past few years. Yeah, I think he's been tremendous. You know who he kind of reminds me of actually is a a, a speedier Michael Hanzus. And Hanzus is a hell of a underrated player for a long time for a lot of good teams, and and he's kind of got a similar game. Like I, he's never going to be a top line center. I don't know if he's ever going to be a second line center to be honest, but he's going to be a hell of a third line center for a decade in this league, hopefully here in Winnipeg. I mean, he just, he doesn't do a lot of things wrong. Like he, he just, there's nothing overly flashy with his game, but he's a moose on the puck. He's difficult to, to, to budge off it. He's, he's physical, he's smart as hell. He's, it's kind of like a coach's dream, right? He's, I, I've just been really, really impressed with him. He's, he's never going to get a Calder vote. He's never going to get an all-star vote, but yeah, you could, uh, you could do worse than having a couple of Gus buses in your, in your bottom six. So uh, he's been, it's been real, real impressive for, for the Winnipeg Jets. No doubt about it. Brandon Rowicki's with us. Uh, B, fill us in on uh, the next episode of Skates and Plates. And, of course, people can search and subscribe to that wherever they're getting the Winnipeg Sports Talk podcast. What's coming up? Yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. We'll break down the, the Montreal game. That, that's pretty much it. Hasn't been anything else that happened this week. It's been a quiet one. So, yeah, I'm just... Just don't suck in this game. Like, uh, I, I, it would just be nice to have like, like, like the St. Louis one. Like, have a have a Blues performance, and we could talk about you know X player coming out and having a hell of a game. It's just, it would, it would be, it just be a downer headed into the weekend. You know, coming off a, an ugly loss to Montreal, and you know, with the way Connor Hellebuck's playing this year. The Jets don't need to be great. They they, they just got to be above average to good. Good will get him in the playoffs the way Hellebuck's played easily above average. They'll still grab a playoff spot. So let's yeah, let's give the let's give the guy some run support back there in this one. Thanks for doing this, buddy. Have a great one. <clears throat> Beauty. Talk soon. All right, there's Brandon Wiki. Make sure you're subscribing to Skates and Plates wherever you're getting at WST. Uh, all right, we're going to hear from Pierre-Luc Dubois coming up in just a second, and then Hacksaw is going to jump on with us. Uh, just before you do that, don't forget, folks, the countdown is on. Tickets on sale right now for the West Finalists. Pack that place, and 
maybe even top the incredible atmosphere from last year's West Final against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. We'll find out who the Bombers are playing this week. But you can count yourself in and make sure you get to the Princess Auto tailgate zone before the game. Just been the place to be before every Bomber game just outside the stadium. $5 beers, three fifty dollars popping hot dogs, DJ Finesse spinning. It is going to be lit heading into that game on the 13th of November. We'll have some fires, warming stations, hot chocolate, and more. And, of course, Princess Auto, great supporters of ours since day one, is also where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Two Winnipeg locations, Panit Road, Portage Avenue West, and you can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Um, the gang at Culligan Water have been a staple in Manitoba for over 65 years as a family-owned business, as the water experts with everything you and your family and business can need. Water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, drinking water systems, and citywide water delivery services, as well as commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Culligan Man can also come out to your home for a water test procedure. And the uh, best way to get onto that and find out everything Culligan can do for you is give them a call at 694-5180 or pop down and see them at 1200 Sargent Avenue. You can also check them out online for all their products and services, serving Manitobans for over 65 years at drinkculligan.com. You know, I got to give a shout out to Kurt, who I met last night out on the town. He's playing a little pool. Kurt, a regular WS tier. I believe he's cowboy in the chat. Popped by and said, Huss, I wanted to thank you. You turned me on to the CC and Ginger. I absolutely love it. I've usually got a six pack in the fridge and uh, it's kind of been, become my go to drink. Love to hear that. And great to meet you last night, Kurt. If you haven't tried the CC and Ginger, what are you waiting for? It's now available at your local beer store in six packs, ready to drink, no mixers. Stick it in a cooler if you need. Be good to go. And, of course, Canadian Club, also proud sponsors of the Bombers. There'll be lots of that being served on the 13th of November. But before that, Manitoba Liquor and Lottery Spirits of Distinction Awards going this weekend. And that will be the official release of the Canadian Club Chronicles 45-year-old Canadian Club, the final installment in the Canadian Club Chronicles series. And now... Only 80 bottles available in Manitoba. But so for you whiskey aficionados, get on out the weekend early next week and make sure you grab one of only 80 bottles of the CC Chronicles. Um, hey, tonight, great night to go to BP if you're not going to the game because we've got NFL football, the Texans hosting the undefeated Philadelphia Eagles, and of course, the Winnipeg Jets on the tube as well. Right now, they're featuring the new fall menu, the craveable jalapeno popper dip, spicy buffalo mac and cheese, and the delicious creamy carbonara pizza. And anytime you watch the NFL at Boston Pizza, you can enter to win a trip for two to Vegas New Year's weekend to see the Niners and Raiders play at Allegiant Stadium and a bonus NHL game between the Golden Knights and Blues on New Year's Eve. Watch the NFL and the Jets and enter to win at your local Boston Pizza each and every game. All right, Hacksaw is going to join us in a few minutes for his weekly visit one day early. Uh, but with the Habs in town, always lots of interested people to hear from Pierre-Luc Dubois. He spoke about the recent road trip, looking ahead to tonight's game, and more. Here is the Winnipeg Jets Center from uh, just a couple hours ago down at Canada Life Center. I'm um, your coach that said yesterday he's not a big believer in morning skates and this would be optional and not a lot of people needed to come out and yet we get a room packed full of veterans who stay out there quite a long time. Uh, how do you explain the want to get on the ice of this group guys? Yeah, we, when I got uh, traded here in Columbus, um, towards the even believe in coming to the rink for morning skates. So a lot of guys just show up, get food and leave. Um, and then when I came here for three years, that's kind of what I did. And then you came here and, uh, you know, guys are on the ice, every optional guys are on the ice. So, um, the, you know, talking to Shive to wheels and I mean, a lot of the guys like to, to skate and, and like to feel the puck and, and all that. Um, and it's, I guess it's what they've done their entire careers and that's what they feel comfortable with. So. At first, I definitely felt the pressure to get out there, um, but then you kind of get used to it, and 
uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I don't think there's any wrong decision. What goes into a, a good start for you guys tonight? Obviously, it's been a point of messaging from the coaching staff leading into this. Yeah, well, it's funny because I think our starts is what's hurt what's hurt us the most. Uh, um, you know, the last road trip we come back home with five out of six points, but if you really if you really look at our games and dissect our games, um, you know, our game in LA was not great at best. Um, our game in Arizona was not really good, and our game in Vegas was one of the worst games um, I've personally played, and one of the worst games I think we've played in, in a long time. So, five out of six feels good, but I, our starts can be a lot better, and it's uh, we're lucky enough to to start tonight at home. What goes into the into a good start? I think just keeping it simple, forward checking, um, being hard on pucks. We talked about our forward check and, and how we want to be a, a good team at that. And I think, you know, you don't have to run the guy through the boards, but if he can just look you off and, and you're skating back and he can make a play and they don't feel the pressure of, you know, sometimes having to rim the puck or chip the puck because you're coming so fast, um, then we're not going to be a good forward checking team. So I think that's, that's kind of where it starts. Um, and then that's, you know, where your game develops and, Maybe at the blue lines in the second and third, the D's are backing off, and, and then you have more time to make plays. What's kind of your read of this Montreal team? Uh, maybe not a ton externally was expected out of them, but it seems like they're opening some eyes and maybe surprising some people. Yeah, they uh, they got some young guys on their team that you know they play with. That I mean, I I'm 24, so I'm still young, but you know, it's funny to talk about young players, but you know they feel with that youth youthness and that excitement level and you know for sometimes it's going to be their first game in Winnipeg it's going to be the first night uh, playing here so you know that that excitement for some guys they haven't played 10 15 games yet so um, they're still on on that cloud of being in the NHL so they're they're uh, it's going to be a tough game tonight um, you know they, they don't have much to lose this year I, I don't think and you know they they just play freely and they've had mixed results this year but I think uh it's going to be a, a dangerous game for us tonight. Did you enjoy that atmosphere when an original six team, a team like Montreal, we saw it with Toronto here a week and a half ago, and probably will be similar tonight. Do you like that? Uh, yeah, that uh, that Toronto game was uh, the rink was electric. Um, you know, it was it was a intense game to play in, and you know, whoever it is, we want to bring that that level of excitement, that level of intensity. So that'll be the same thing for us tonight. I don't imagine that you have that same type of experience when you were playing in Columbus, where these uh, original six teams come in and the, and the house is divided. Yeah, uh, in Columbus it happened against Detroit a bit, uh, a bit against Pittsburgh. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was an intense game. But I mean, there's a lot of passionate fan bases in the NHL, so when they clash like that, it's uh, you're sure for you're you're gonna have a good crowd. It seems like it's a it seems like it's a pretty common story. I've heard this ever since I was young in hockey. A team that goes on a tear and does really well, by the time they get to that end of the tear, they'll say that sometimes, you know, you get the success, but bad habits are kind of seeping in. And then that team will often, you know, follow up a long tear with, you know, kind of falling off a little bit. What goes into the process of, of catching the bad habits uh, before it, it kind of ends up costing you in the points department? Yeah, I think it's a, it can be a slippery slope because, you know, you can, in a way, you can miss the playoffs because of points you drop early on in the season. You know, you can miss the playoffs by three points because you played poorly in October. But at the same time, you want to build your game. So in during the playoff run or the playoff race at the end of the year, you're playing your best hockey. Um, so it, it is a league based on results at the end of the day. Uh, if we have a great season, great second half, we miss the playoffs, we didn't have a great season. Um, so, you know, it's... it's uh, it's a tough kind of concept to to really understand properly, and that's what the coaching staff is, is here for, and you know the points of how we have to play and what we have to do. And yeah, we're getting points right now, but we haven't been playing really the brand of hockey we want to play. So if you know we figure that if we can play how we want to play and get the points, you know the sky's the limit for us. So um, it'll be important for us to to do some video to talk. Uh, you know this game coming back from. Three-game uh, road, sorry, uh, three-game road uh, streak was, is going to be important for us tonight. How far along are you, Blake, and Cole in building that kind of chemistry that you can describe as second nature between the mm -hmm. three, three, four lines? 
Yeah, I, I think we're still we're still looking for it. Um, with the the new kind of uh, systems we want to play here too, with with within the team, um, you know, everybody's role and trying to get used to that, and then you know, as a line, trying to get used to to what each other, what we all want, and what we all like out there. Um, we try to talk a lot in the dressing room, uh, on the bench, doing video and all that stuff. I think that's how we'll we'll get to the to the point where you don't even have to think out there and you just play. All right, good stuff with PLD. He'll be in the lineup tonight. Jets have 7 p.m. Canada Life Center. We'll break it all down tomorrow with Ken Weeb on the program. Well, normally Fridays, it's Beer Friday, and Lee Haxel Hamilton joins us. But uh, with the Habs in town, maybe it's Beer Thursday. We get a little early visit from Hacksaw as he's going to be traveling tomorrow, and the legend himself joins us now. Lee, what's going on? How are you, my friend? Bustler, great to see you, hear from you. A uh, lot going on in the National Football League. We're kind of scuffling, stumbling, struggling to get to the midseason of, of the 17-game schedule, and we've just come through a wild NFL trading deadline period. So that's kind of the storyline, and there's so many controversies and so many quarterbacks having so many problems. So, yeah, there's a lot to get to in the NFL. Well, I mean, you covered this league uh, for a long time. Is this the most active trade deadline you can remember in the NFL? Historically, yes. Uh, and I, I think the rationale, I have to understand this, uh, Andrew, is that there's a new breed of general manager that's taken over. It's almost almost equitable to what's happened in Major League Baseball, where all these sabermetric guys, these Harvard graduates, have become executives in baseball. Well, this is filtering into the NFL. And I just think there's a new philosophy in the National Football League. Hustler, I'm the new general manager of the team. I didn't draft you. You don't play well in my system. I'm getting rid of you. I don't care about the cap hit. I didn't make that decision. And I'll trade draft picks if I have to to get you out of here. And I think that's what's happened. We had 17 trades at the NFL deadline. It's an all-time record high. I mean, you know, I was the voice of the Chargers and Seahawks for 17 years. And and if you had one trade at the deadline, that was a lot. And so just the, the, the whole structure of the National Football League is, is really different. Uh, the Christian McCaffrey trade was a blockbuster. Uh, San Francisco paid a steep, steep price, but they're pushing all their chips to the table this year, trying to be a Super Bowl team in the NFC, and maybe they're going to be because they got a half a season with McCaffrey to do his thing. Miami's done the same thing. Uh, you know, they traded a number one draft pick to get Brad Chubb, the big defensive end from Denver, and he's a really good football player. And he's, he's a he, different type of defensive end. He's just he's not an explosive pass rush guy alone he's big against the run he's probably got more jj watt in him than he's got joey bose in him so miami makes that deal and i thought that was positive i think one of the strangest deals was up your way uh detroit trading within the division minnesota and the lions yeah. are going nowhere it's been kind of a disappointing season and they trade tj hawkinson the tight end he goes to minnesota boy that what a great fit that is for kevin o'connell's team because now he's got three wideouts He's got Dalvin Cook, he's got Kirk Cousins, and he's got a tight end that goes anywhere and catches any type of ball you throw to him, including bounce passes. So I, I thought that was a really good trade. And, and then one other deal uh, of real interesting note to me, Buffalo's got all these dynamics. You know, Buffalo leads the league in offense, is number one in the NFL in defense. And they got Josh Allen and make everything happen in Buffalo, Andrew. And they went out and they made the trade to get Nye Hicks uh, from the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, and, and I'll tell you what, he was behind Jonathan Taylor, but when he played, he played really, really well. He's been a little bit dinged up this year, but he's different than any of the other running backs that they got in Buffalo because he can run it and he's he's got quick burst, but he catches a ton of balls out of the backfield. So now this is just another weapon to complement Stephon Diggs and to complement the tight end they got. And Buffalo's just got every, they checked off every box you can have offensively and defensively and Man, if we played a Super Bowl next week, the Bills would be it, and, and they, they go out and get this Colts running back. Uh, Himes really makes a difference. Yeah, he is a very versatile player, and it's quite clear that, that James Cook that they picked in the draft hasn't turned into the guy that they wanted, and um, Zach Moss wasn't playing, so they made that deal. I, I just want to – you mentioned the Chubb trade, and maybe the most fascinating thing – and I guess this involves the Niners as well – the Niners didn't have a ton of draft capital, so they had to drop a, a two, a three, a four, and a five to get McCaffrey, and it looked well worth it last week. He was incredible in that game and a big win over the Rams. But when you look back to the trade tree 
of the Trey Lance deal and what Miami got from the Niners, they have turned those picks into Jalen Waddle, Tyreek Hill, and now Bradley Chubb. And, you know, with that comes big money on your salary cap, Lee. But I can't remember a team or organization making a trade like that where they're getting number one picks and then trading all of them and so quickly building themselves into a legitimate power in the AFC. Well, I think that's that's a real astute point. Uh, you know, I'd have to think back for an extended period to see if there's somebody else that comes to mind. Off the top of my head, now this goes back a while, Jimmy Johnson did a lot of that with the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, if you recall the multiples of multiples of trades he made, including the Herschel Walker to Minnesota Viking grand theft deal that he made that netted him all those picks that became Troy Aikman and Emmett Smith and all those guys, and then he traded other picks to get more players. Uh, I don't know that anybody in modern day football has cashed in as many chips after making the kind of deals they did. Jimmy Johnson went from one in 15 to, you know, winning a couple of Super Bowls along the way. San Francisco has obviously mortgaged everything in the future now because they traded three number one picks to make the Trey Lance acquisition. And he still hasn't proven that he's ready to play in the league. But thank goodness that they retained Jimmy Garoppolo and they look like they have everything covered. I'll say this about McCaffrey dynamic player and we saw a lot of him out here because he played at Stanford in the Pac-12 conference and the thing that I like about him is he's a tough guy who can run it inside he obviously gets to the edge really quick he's got an extra gear and not only does he catch the ball he runs the ball and he blitz blocks I mean he's a three down running back I think he had 7,300 all-purpose yards in about four plus seasons in Carolina and that included two significant injuries and he was playing on a really bad team so this is a tremendous, tremendous talent. And you take the completeness now of their offense with McCaffrey in San Francisco, plus the wide receivers, plus the tight ends, et cetera. Uh, and then you add into that the mean street defense that they play. That's a pretty good football team they got in the Bay Area. And we got half a season for them to kind of put everything together, make it all fit and get ready for the playoffs. Well, and you know what? The Niners beat the daylights out of the Rams again in the regular season on the weekend. And it's sort of an interesting segue from the trade deadline and how active it was to where the Rams are. Les Snead, after winning the GM of the Rams, after winning the, the Super Bowl, famously had his F them pick shirt on. Um, Lee, what do you make of the Rams situation? And are they essentially now paying the price for some overdue invoices from previous seasons? Yeah, it's like the wife when she puts it all on a credit card somewhere, somehow down road, you got to pay it. Uh, and I think that's what's happened now. And it's been complicated by the injuries. You know, you and I talked, I, I remember back in August, the last week of August, when we did our NFL preview package, um, we, we talked about the Rams and there was no Andrew Whitworth, the li likely Hall of Fame left tackle, he retired. They had plugged in a whole bunch of people and they've gone through six offensive linemen now who've been hurt. In addition to the fact there is no superstar left tackle there anymore. Matthew Stafford's taken hits. Matthew Stafford's not throwing the ball deep down the field. It's a byproduct of maybe the elbow injury or a byproduct of they don't have a deep threat to complement Cooper Cup. There is no Od Odell Beckham. Uh, somebody needs to explain to me why you would give $15 million a year to Allen Robinson of the Chicago Bears and then not target him on a consistent basis. And, I mean, the Rams are playing really hard on defense, but they are giving up yards, and their defense is being asked to play an awful lot on the field. It's just not the same team. It's just not the same feel at L.A. Rams football. Do you know uh, last week the 49ers went in there and nailed them? There were more people wearing red than there were Rams blue in that stadium. Now, maybe that's an indictment of L.A. football fan that if the team's good, they'll go see it. And if not, well, then we'll let somebody wearing the other team's color sit in my seats. It's, it's the same thing as befallen the Chargers. They've been decimated by injuries, and they are no longer looking like – an elite team in the AFC and their offense has become very pedestrian and they can't stop the run and they can't stop getting gouged. They've given up 13 plays of plus 35 in the first eight weeks of the season. And this was supposed to be a Super Bowl team. And, you know, they don't have their left tackle and their center's got a chronic knee issue and they're playing rookies uh, at, at, at guard and at right tackle. And the quarterback got hurt and he's trying to gut it out. They got Austin Eckler, the running back against the world. And on the defensive side, there is no Joey Bosa. And Khalil Mack can't do it by himself. And they're getting gouged with passes down the field. And I've never seen a team give up as many big runs, chunk runs, 
35, 40, 50, 73, 76 yards. Those are runs that Charger defense has given up. So in L.A., both these franchises got a problem right now. Well, you mentioned the Chargers. And, I mean, I, I mean, I was maybe as guilty as anyone for hyping up the AFC West this year. I mean, I'll always back the Chiefs. I think they're an elite team and expected them to be despite Tyreek Hill leaving. But you had huge expectations for the Chargers. You had the Raiders pick up Devontae Adams and seeming like they were ready to be in the mix as a significant team. And the Broncos maybe had the highest expectations of them all. And yet here they are trading away Brad Chubb to get picks at the deadline halfway through Russell Wilson's first season. Hard to imagine three quarters of that division being more disappointing than they have been, Lee. But give us your take on where you can sort of mention the Chargers issues. I mean, the rest of the division, and particularly Josh McDaniels in L in the Vegas with the Raiders, and just the mess that's become of the Broncos season despite their win overseas last weekend. Well, we'll just start at the top. Kansas City's averaging 408 yards per game. Their defense has vastly improved because they've added a lot of athletes. It's a very different defense right now. Now, you know, they got to keep the defensive end Frank Clark out of trouble. He keeps getting in trouble, but he's still a pretty good football player. And, and Chris Jones has had a real bounce back season. So Kansas City is a complete football team. And they answered the question, life after Tyreek will be okay because Andy Reid and those player personnel guys, Brett Veach, their general manager, they go find guys who are fast and guys who can play. So Kansas City has replaced Tyreek Hill. They've got the salary cap space and they're just dynamic offensively. And Mahomes is Mahomes. Uh, the Chargers situation, you can't lose as many guys as they lost around that quarterback. And then you can't have the quarterback suffer the rib cartilage damage that he did early in the season. And he's only about at a 50% capacity. He can't move the pocket. He, he runs some. He shouldn't be running at all, trying to make some plays. But he just can't do it by himself. Uh, the Raiders situation boggles my mind. You know, they, they, they brought in Josh McDaniels, who had failed initially in Denver, went back and had great success, rebuilt his resume uh, with Belichick in New England. And... He has just really scuffled calling plays. Now, I have no understanding of why you run what you run. And it started the week week one when the Raiders played the Chargers. They hardly targeted uh, Darren Waller, the tight end. Uh, they kept throwing to Devontae Adams, who was double cover. They never went to Hunter Renfro until the game was had already been decided and it would become a, a, a lopsided loss. And they've just continued to do that. I mean, how can you pay that kind of money and not create packages that will allow Devontae Adams to dominate. And if they're going to double him, fine. Then you go to those tight ends and you go to that other receiver. And now they've had a breakout season from Josh Jacobs, uh, former number one pick is playing pretty well for them and doing a lot of heavy duty stuff, but it's at the cost of not going down the field. And defensively, they've, they've just never been right. Uh, they're, they're pitiful on defense. They run a lot of players through there. They're awful young. Uh, it's just, just they don't have enough and they don't have the right guys that they have. Uh, I'll give you a stat. They're giving up on third down conversions, 46% third down conversion. That's one of the worst third down defensive rates I've seen anywhere in modern day NFL. So they're a mess. And after the ugliness of that shutout loss and the beatdown in New Orleans, it was a 35 minute meeting right after the game between Mark Davis, Dave Ziegler, the new general manager and Josh McDaniels. And Mark Davis is really upset. And I don't think he's going to fire uh, this coach right now, but I don't understand the whole train of thought as to why you're doing what you're doing. And the Denver situation um, hired the wrong coach. Nathaniel Hackett's way in over his head. We've talked about that. George Payton, who came from Minnesota as a new general manager, has got his hands full. He inherited a pile of players from the El Ray era, and he slowly weeded them out, including Chubb, whom he evidently did not want to sign to an extension. And Chubb yesterday <clears throat> or last night signed a five-year contract extension. Russell Wilson doesn't seem to be the same player. That's a big issue. I don't like the play calling. All their young wide receivers, they started the season with three really good young wide receivers. They've all been hurt. They've lost their top running back, Javante Williams. I mean, this is just a, a horrific offensive season, and they're stuck with this big contract they just gave Russell Wilson. Defense, defense really plays well. What Vic Fangio left behind, he left a lot of really good players there, but you can't have your defense play 58 minutes a game. So Denver's, Denver is a mess. The Raiders have question marks everywhere. And then obviously the Chargers are so busted up, hell. 
and you look at what's left on the schedule, you get a chance. Pull up the Rams and Chargers schedule uh, for the last eight weeks of the season. Tell me if either one of those teams are going to win half those games. The schedule is just a meat grinder for both of them, and both of them are really hurt. So, yeah, it's Kansas City's division. And can we just fast forward to the playoffs now and just go play Buffalo and just decide it? Uh, I'd be here for it, although I'm looking forward to the next couple months of football before we get there. Lee Hacksaw Hamilton's with us. Lee, before we go, I, I, it's funny you bring up the Herschel Walker trade because I've mentioned that the way things are looking for both the Seahawks and the Broncos, this Russell Wilson trade could be spoken of in terms almost – in the Herschel Walker trade. I mean, could be one of the biggest deals we've seen in recent NFL history for sure. The Seahawks, for my money, are maybe the best story and the most surprising team. The Broncos have to be in the mix for the most disappointing team, but man, do they have company. Who, in your opinion, is the most disappointing team this year? Is it the Broncos? Is it the Super Bowl champion Rams? Is it Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Or is it the Green Bay Packers? Or am I missing someone? No, I think you've kind of checked off all the boxes. Uh, uh, I'll give you a quick response. Seattle's really played well, but look at the last eight weeks of the season and who they play. I don't know if they survive this. And I know I know it, it, it's it's the, the candy of the week thing to say, Ooh, look at Geno Smith, what has become. Well, talk to me the first week of January when the season's completed and how Geno does against really, really tough people. So Seattle's been a surprise. Uh, I laughed last week. I think I told you, you know, there's nothing wrong. Don't adjust your TV set. There's nothing wrong with your eyesight. Yes, those are the New York Giants are playing pretty well. But then they got smoked uh, by, by Seattle, and the Giants still have to play Philadelphia twice, etc. So I, I don't know that they're going to stay upper echelon in the NFC. Jets, uh, the Jets, to me, are a bit of a surprise. Their young quarterback got hurt, Zach Wilson. Now he's back. He's hot. He's cold some weekends. Jets are doing this without probably three-fourths of their offensive line. They have terrible injuries. But uh, Robert Salah has got those guys playing really tough guy defense. So the Jets Jets have to be a little bit of a surprise. Uh, disappointment, I don't know what, what Jekyll Hyde, Arizona, is all about. I don't know whether Kingsbury's the right coach there. Got Kyler Murray, but, man, there's a lot of things that aren't right in Arizona. That's an issue. Shocked at the demise of Indianapolis and how Matt Ryan has gotten battered and how poorly he's played. But he's lost virtually everybody around him. Offensive front, his three receivers, two running backs. Um, I don't think Frank Reich's going to get fired, but they, they got some evaluation to do as to why this has turned out so bad. I would have thought Jacksonville would have made a little bit more progress uh, under Doug Peterson. Had the good start, but now they're kind of in the, enthralled in a, in a five-game losing streak. I think that's, that's a bit of a struggle. Uh, Green Bay, their defense really disappoints me because they've drafted a lot of defensive guys, and boy, they're getting run on and they're getting thrown on. That kind of surprises me. And in terms of the struggles on offense, that's that's a byproduct of not having Devontae Adams and the number one pick, Christian Watson's had three different injuries, and they can't keep Lazard on the field. And you know, Aaron Rodgers, I, I might have mentioned this last week. Aaron Rodgers, you know, he wanted his $40 million contract. Well, that came at a cost, not just dollars and cents. It came at the cost of Devontae Adams, whom they couldn't afford to keep. So Rodgers doesn't have any ground to stand on. But Aaron's playing well. He just he has got young guys he's got to drag with him and grow into being pro players, and they haven't haven't done that yet. So I think Green Bay's a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, injuries probably play a role in that too. Well, we'll uh, look forward to some big teams on buys this week. Chiefs back, and now, of course, we do have any thoughts on this Thursday night or tonight. Can the Houston Texans hang with the Eagles and at least uh, maybe give the uh, people that have decided that they're going to get them to cover 14 points uh, stay in the game, or is this going to be one of those games where you look for something else after halftime? I didn't expect much from Houston this year, and given us even less. I mean, that's a franchise. It's an <laughs> utter disarray. It's, it's ownership. It's leadership, and I don't know whether Lovey Smith's the right guy. He didn't have much of a roster. I mean, you know, last week at halftime, at halftime, Davis Mills, the Houston quarterback, had 17 yards passing. This is the NFL, 17 yards passing at halftime. I mean, Houston just doesn't have much of a roster. And this is a franchise that a couple of falls ago, you and I would have been talking about Deshaun Watson and Donder Hopkins and J.J. Watt and all these other guys. And uh, Walt Whitley Merciless, all those guys are gone. It's, Hardly anything there. So it's going to be a long, long road back for them. Well, they got the Philadelphia, from Cleveland for Deshaun they, they Watson the real over the deal. next few years. 
Yeah, no doubt. Lee, thanks so much for doing this. Have a great, safe trip up north uh, with the fam. And uh, we'll look forward to catching up uh, next week, hopefully. Uh, thanks so much. And, of course, we'll check out LeeHacksawHamilton.com for the latest. And, folks, check out Lee on YouTube as well. Podcasts are up and they are cracking. Have a good one, my friend. Have a great sports weekend. Hustle it. Nice to talk, chat with you again. Pete, take care. You got it. Uh, one day early from a normal Friday visit. That is the NFL notebook on Winnipeg Sports Talk with the legendary Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. All right. We do need to get out because we got to get these pods up before uh, so people can listen to it before the game tonight. But let's quickly get to the cool bet lines and allow me, folks, to do a little bit of a victory lap here. Um, I know some of you were riding with me last night on that three-sport parlay we dropped at the Cool Bet exclusives. We needed the Buffalo Sabres to win. Jeremy needed him too. Big five-goal comeback in the third period. Buffalo, check. That was our Cool Bet play of the day as well. Astros to win on the money line. No hitter. They won. And the iffy pick of it was the Utah Jazz plus six in Dallas. Had to sweat that out, but it came through. A 7-1 to one exclusive and the pick of the day. A perfect day in the lock shop. So it was a, uh, it was great. By the way, speaking of the lock shop, I'm going to throw this in the chat right now. And you can check out my Twitter. I've got a pinned tweet. But Dusty and I, now that we've expanded the lock shop, are taking it to YouTube. Many of you are watching us on YouTube right now. And to launch the channel... We're doing a little bit of a big, well, it's not a little giveaway. It's a big giveaway. A thousand bucks for one of our first 1,000 subscribers. Now, if you're with us right now in YouTube, I'm just putting in, I will paste the link. Head on over there. Give us a sub. Subscribe to the channel. And, of course, you should already be subscribed to Winnipeg Sports Talk. It goes without saying. Hit that red subscribe button here. And then go over to my Twitter, or you can just go to at LockShopBets. You're going to need to retweet that and subscribe to the channel. And we're going to be doing a giveaway. Dusty's, I was already flashing the cash today on the program. Uh, we've got it ready to go. And as uh, our pal Didier said, we gave away a thousand bucks last night. I guess anyone that wanted to bet 143 because we did give out that seven to one winner. So kindly support us on the lock shop side of things. We have so much fun. Dusty's amazing. We're going to do is basically five, six days a week, shorter, subscribe to the podcast, wherever you get, but YouTube is where you're going to find us very soon. The latest episode will be up there right now. So get in there, get subbed. And uh, hopefully we might be uh, piecing you off a bunch of fifties and a thousand bucks coming up over the next few weeks as we do our drive to 1000 subscribers for the lock shop. All right. Let's see if we can get some more winners tonight. Uh, I got to do the uh, cool bet pick coming up, but I'm going to do that right after the program. Um, we do daily pick either myself or Dustin every day at Cool Bet Canada. Uh, and of course, if you haven't played a cool bet before, you want to take advantage of some of our exclusives like last night, which was I'm just glad they're still in business after what we did to them, to be honest with you. Um, you can use the promo code WST on your first pro, on your first deposit at uh, Cool Bet. We'll give you a 100% bonus on your first deposit up to 200 bucks. I think I'm leaning towards the New York Rangers tonight. Um, they're at home against the Boston Bruins. Shesterkin is playing great. He just coming off that shutout against Philly earlier this week. And Boston, um, this is the issue with the Boston Bruins. No Jeremy Swayman for the next while. We'll get confirmation on how bad this injury is. But it's Linus Allmark that's in net for Boston tonight. Igor Shesterk, and I think the Rangers are ready to score some goals. So we're going to slam New York at home at MSG against the Bruins at minus 130. Um, busy, busy slate tonight. Um, go, Vegas in Ottawa. Vegas minus 147 favorite. I think they're going with the backup. Uh, Washington minus 122 in Detroit against the Wings. You've got the hate. Uh, well, this is almost a pick em. Canes and Lightning. Lightning, a very slight home favorite at minus 112. As I mentioned, Rangers, minus 130, like them. Minnesota Wild, minus 172 over the Seattle Kraken. Throwing that on our daily parlay. Blues and Islanders. Blues got a snap out of it. They're a slight home favorite, minus 115. Jets are a big favorite. The Jets have not been a favorite like this in a while. Minus 208 at home against the Montreal Canadiens. And only plus 122 on the puck line to win by two. 
We'll get a couple goal scores there in a minute, but just the rest of the games. Kings minus 192 favorites in Chicago. Calgary coming off that collapse against the Kraken two days ago. They're minus 217 at home against the Nashville Predators. The Oilers taking on the streaking Devils uh, at home tonight. Edmonton minus 145. They're going on the parlay as well. Dallas, a heavy favorite, minus 233 against the Arizona Coyotes, who stung Paul Maurice's Panthers and Mo Godfamelkad in their last time out. Canucks at home, minus 175 favorites against the Anaheim Ducks. And yes, Paul Maurice's Panthers will look to bounce back from that loss at the hands of Carl Vemelka, who made 41 saves. They're minus 196 favorites in San Jose against the Sharks. Just quickly back to this Jets-Habs game. Kyle Connor's got to score sooner or later, right? Hopefully it is tonight. Uh, but let's see if we can get the... I'm having a tough time getting up the uh, the player uh, the player numbers on this, but I'm sure they'll be later on. You can check out Cool Bet. And, uh, okay, here we go. Player goals, Kyle Connor. My computer is being very, very slow right now. Will score. Kyle Connor is plus 132. I think we may have to make that. It's It's got to end sooner or later. If you're with me and you think Kyle Connor scores tonight, you can get that at plus 132. Shifley plus 157. PLD plus 173. And Cole Caulfield, who's been the wizard scoring goals for the Montreal Canadiens so far, top number on the Habs side of things at plus 190. Um, points, goals, shots, assists, you can bet on it all, whatever you like over at Cool Bet. And uh, as I say, Follow the channel at Cool Bet Canada on socials. Um, we're going to do a big announcement tomorrow on something that uh, I can't believe we're doing, but we are doing with Cool Bet. I'll let you know about that tomorrow. You're definitely going to want to be following their social channels for what we get to on the announcement tomorrow. Uh, but good luck. Um, just once again, Rangers, Wild, Oilers. Let's see if we can keep this going right now. That's plus 373. Uh, but the pick of the night is going to be the Rangers, and I think we will put a little sprinkle on that Kyle Connor goal. Um, I'm going to throw this in one more time in the chat. If you missed it, this is the link to the YouTube channel for the Lock Shop. Make sure you get over there, subscribe to the channel, get on over to Twitter, retweet the tweet from the Lock Shop so you're eligible to win our $1,000 giveaway as we move the Lock Shop to our new space over on YouTube. Um, great show. Looking forward to this game tonight. I'm going to be there. Hopefully, maybe we'll bump into a few of you there tomorrow, or there tonight. And tomorrow on the program, it's going to be packed. We'll have a big breakdown of the Jets start to the homestand with Ken Weeb. We'll also get ready for the CFL weekend in the playoffs. Justin Dunk is going to join us. And I think Dustin Nielsen will also join us off the top of the program as well. I'll talk a little bit more about what we got cooking on the lock shop little NHL, NFL talk, and, of course, the latest on a big night in the National Hockey League. And um, probably have to hook up with the Fink as well. Big weekend for the Moose coming up, and we'll have some Moose tickets to give away tomorrow on the program as well. Folks, that's going to do it for us. Thanks to MoCon, Brandon Rowicki, and, of course, Hacksaw, and Jay Remo, who very well make an appearance on the show tomorrow. After this Jets-Habs game, we'll look forward to having him on. And uh, most importantly, thanks to him for getting us on and off the air and getting these podcasts up so you all can listen to it before puck drop tonight. That's going to do it for us today on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Have a great afternoon and evening. Enjoy the game tonight, and we'll see you tomorrow on a Friday edition of WST. Oh, my God. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.